And here's what I like to say to someone who's having trouble even fathoming what you and I are talking about right now. As I point out that the official numbers, whether they come from UNICEF or the World Health Organization or various organizations with abuse and missing children in the title or whatever, is that some, in the world, somewhere between one and 10 million kids a year are disappearing. It's a huge number. And so what I like to do to get someone to pause long enough to say, okay, I have to think about that now, is ask them, where do they go? <laughs> a million to 10 million people, where are these kids going? You don't buy a kid cheap. The networks are professional, sophisticated. The brainwashing techniques to do things to children are sort of military grade. Yeah. Um, I think it's worse in Europe than the US because I, I think it tracks uh, royal bloodlines more. So I think Europe has has the network of, and, and, and then you find out that a lot, a lot of kids who are not technically missing are probably, part of multi-generational satanic cults within families. Okay, Dave Collum, thank you for your time. Welcome to the show. Back again. Yeah, it's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Dave, um, um, I want. I, I read your post just late recently. Uh, I think you you wanted to like sit down and because there's a lot of things going on in your mind to write down maybe an article on the on the interview with Tucker Carlson and Putin. But I still want to ask you, Lynn, do you generally think it was a good idea in general? Just let it. I mean, I have so many um, biases and thoughts and reservations about this whole interview, and uh, but uh, in general, I think it was a good thing. You know that. Uh, uh, Tucker Carlson went to you know Moscow at this at this critical time and you know and just let him talk you know uh, Putin. So what do what do you think? What do you think about this whole thing in general? Well, well, first of all, I mean historically that's always been encouraged, right? That's the job of journalists. So the fact that Tucker Carlson was ridiculed by many in the political sphere uh, was this simply a manifestation of the fact that they were terrified that Putin would say something that would show that they've been lying to us constantly. And and I would say Putin did an okay job. It's it's a bit of a dry subject for people. So it's not as exciting to hear about, you know, you know, the, the geopolitics of Ukraine and things like that. But um I, I think Putin told a very honest story because of course um he was pretty sure he'd be fact checked, right? So so if he lies, there's no upside there. Um, I was using it as a fact check because, as you may recall, in 2022, I wrote a lot on Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I went from not knowing where it was on the map sort of person to to writing probably 75 pages or something on the whole meaning of it. I've been following Putin, on the other hand, for for many years, intrigued by him. And um, and I got to the end of my 2022 analysis, having written myself through the ignorance and to some variant of wisdom, in which I concluded that Putin was a, a superb choice of leader for Russia, that, um, as I said, you know, Justin Trudeau could not lead Russia. It's a place that requires a strong man. Um, I, I pointed out that that many of the claims that he was psychotic or 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 losing his mind or a madman were just not correct at all. Mm -hmm. I think he was I one time did a poll said, which of the following leaders do you think most care about the country that they lead? And I, I the obvious choice was Biden, Putin. I think I put in Trudeau and some one other person. I can't remember who. Putin got 71 percent of the vote. So the, wow. there are people out there who know that Putin is doing what he thinks is best for Mother Russia. Now, um, what most people are ignorant of are the geopolitics from 2014 to 2022. And I was unable to refute a growing thesis that basically said NATO had been a pain in Putin's butt every step of the way that every time he tried to play fair with NATO, NATO lied to him and deceived him. And that for some reason, we let people like Victoria Newland, who who I think would be a great day if she walked into the wrong crosswalk and got hit by a freight train, um, 
I think she's a menace to society. Uh, I think our we've got neocons that are living in another decade. They have not realized that the world is a different place. Um, I am confident that if NATO wanted to not let the war happen, they had the power to do so. I'm confident that Zelensky had limited say over whether the war happened yeah. and that uh, Zelensky is our puppet and that uh, and that we're dumping vast sums of money into his pocket. We're dumping vast sums of money into the industrial military complex's pocket. And we want, for some reason, we want to destroy Russia. And I have not been able to formulate a coherent argument for why destroying Russia is a good idea. It seems to me that it's a dangerous idea. Um, people talked about how great it was that Biden was sounding like Reagan calling for regime change. Reagan never called for regime change because mm. that's suicidal to call for regime change. So if a guy's a leader of a superpower and you say we want to get rid of him, what's his next move but to destroy you? So, and we had all sorts of idiots, you know, from Kamala Harris to to Pelosi to you name it, calling for regime change and calling to nuke them and all sorts of crazy stuff. The voice of reason during that entire calendar year was Putin saying, "Don't go there. This is stupid." So, and they, you know, I just listened to a, a general this morning. Actually, I thought it was going to be an interesting analysis, but it turns out that um, it was just pure propaganda in which he talked about Ukraine's heroic efforts to defeat Russia and how Ukraine has to defeat. Ukraine is not going to defeat Russia, period, in my opinion. Yeah. There's no chance that Ukraine will defeat Russia. Therefore, to have a, a model that you're acting upon the assumption as possible is a fool's game. And I think when we're done, Putin will get what he had to get. And that is Putin doesn't need Ukraine. He needs to keep NATO from taking Ukraine from him. Mm -hmm. So NATO wants to be able to choke Putin. Um, they've said it in as many ways as theoretically possible. I mean, they're open about it. And Putin has responded to that and said, OK, we can't let him take Ukraine because Ukraine gives us access to was it the Black Sea and and every invader that ever came into Russia came through Ukraine. And so it, it's a real existential risk for Russia. So Putin told them over the previous dozen years and every imaginable way possible, I, you know, you can't take Ukraine away. You, you just can't do that. It is an existential risk for Russia. And a rational individual like George Kennan, who is a super neocon in, in his own way, is one of the great cold warriors. When we moved NATO east in 1997, Kennan said it was the worst um, political policy mistake that the U.S. has ever made. And we kept promising Putin and we kept lying to him. Guys like um, McFall, the, the, the you know, ambassador to, to Russia, laughs about lying to Putin. And whereas someone like John Mearsheimer says, look, when, when leaders of countries get together, they don't lie to each other. They put the cards on the table. They talk. They'll lie to the people. You know, when Kennedy agreed to take missiles out of what was it, Turkey, I think it was, he said to to Khrushchev, he said, look, we will take the missiles out. If for some reason this plan leaks, we will claim we're not going to do it, but we will do it. And Khrushchev said, OK, that's how that's how diplomacy is done. And um, and we did shit like that to Putin and then we reneged. So I think that NATO is nearly 100 percent culpable. So when people say, well, you know, um, but Putin's the aggressor. I then drop to the most basal level and I say, OK, uh, which country bombed more countries, U.S. or Russia, in the last 20 years? And if you answer Russia, you're just a clueless moron. If you ask who killed more people in the last 20 years, U.S. or Russia, if you answer Russia, you're still a clueless moron. We killed 4.5 million people in the Middle East. That's a holocaust. We somehow justify it. I, I don't know where you justify it. So right now we've got a country that was unnecessarily destroyed. And it was a country that had promise. So now its infrastructure has finally been bombed into oblivion, best I can tell. Putin really tried not to hit infrastructure because he knew at the end yeah. he'd have to rebuild it. Yeah. But then it got real when we blew up pipelines and bridges and stuff like that. And he said, oh, shit, 
this is real. The NATO's not going to back away. So he pulled out the big guns. We were cackling about what a bunch of meatballs they are. Now they don't have a military in Putin. Mm-hmm. Putin has more tanks than the rest of Europe. And okay, so, me, mm-hmm. so we get lied to a lot. And yeah. I don't like that. Let me ask you something. I mean, you know, for people like you or me or other people, you know, in, in this space who are been investigating, researching, reading, mm-hmm. or listening to, you know, people like uh, Whitney Webb or, you know, inv- other mm-hmm. investigative journalists, isn't li- like, uh, it was like nearly, no- I mean, really 99% is nothing new what Putin was talking about. He, or- he's, he told us nothing that I hadn't heard. Exactly. And this there is might what have been I was, a couple I mean, of things. I had, might have been a couple things. I had really high expectations because because uh, the things he usually are, are other topics like really like you know the things that you have been researching also and writing about. I mean the systemic corruption, blackmail operations, money laundering, pedophilia, mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. I mean you can think of. Usually he he does that, or I mean as far as I know, to audience to the Russian audience to presentation in in presentations interviews with the rich Russian audience or maybe in some other, uh, you know, formats. But that that's what was surprising. I mean, he goes, I mean, it was great, you know, to go the 30 minutes into fucking, you know, like historical. I mean, it was great, you know, it's just, just to have a bigger picture. Like what's, what was, you know, how, how did this whole thing evolve? And, 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 but, um, and maybe I'm not sure. Do you think, and first of all, do you think Tucker Carlson was prepared or was this like more or less like scripted qu- question? I mean, he's not a Russian expert. Well, also, I think Tucker's job was to sit down there and get Putin to talk for two hours. Okay. Okay. Right. So Putin's Tucker was showing impatience at the beginning and he thought he was being stonewalled as he admitted. But then what Tucker said and what turned out to be true is Putin said, do you have any more questions? So Putin in no way froze the clock. He wasn't like some Sunday morning talk show where, where someone just babbles incoherently knowing that eventually we're going to go to commercial. And so all he has to do is make sure we get to commercial. Putin gave Tucker everything Tucker asked for. He, Tucker got two hours. Um, I think the 15-minute part might have had another motive. So first of all, what I'll tell you is I think the average American could use a few 15-minute history lessons. Uh-huh. Right? We're not very good at history. So mm-hmm. where did you grow up? Where did you grow up? I grew up uh, until seven years old in Iran and then the rest of my time in, in Austria in right. Vienna, Austria, and then in the Un- United States for five years. So so when you grow up in places like that, you learn history. In the United States, we're not even, we don't even know the capitals of our yeah. own you don't, states, You guys right? don't even know where Austria is. We're, we're really idiots. <laughs> we're Australia. really idiots. Yeah, I know. Yeah, what's the difference? A letter. Um, so we learn history. We learn geography from, from network news. When something bad happens, we go, oh, that's where Ukraine is, right? You know, and and... And so, so for you guys, that's just, that's just Europe, right? That's just, that was just backdrop. What I think he might've been doing, and it's just a hunch. And so I put out a tweet, I don't know if you saw this, but I said, uh, sincere question, um, what were the lies that Putin yeah. gave us, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I got some answers, one or two that were credible. One was that the US inflation rate was 3%. And I go, yeah, but he's citing our numbers. Um, there were a couple that were just not right. They said, well, the whole thing was a lie. And I go, no, that's not an answer. That's not an answer. Yeah. Um, I think the whole thing was factually correct for the most part. Yeah. There was some things like he, he said Hitler didn't want to invade Poland. And and people said, oh, that's clearly wrong. And I go, no, no. I, I could say Putin didn't want to invade Ukraine either. But then it became, but, but I have to. Yeah. So, so the want is such a vague thing. That you can't say that's a lie. You, Hitler might not have wanted to invade Poland right. at one point, but then whatever happened, he said, okay, now we're going to invade Poland, right? Um, and again, as an American, I barely understand what he was talking about there. Um, I think what he might have been doing is something I saw Trump do. Remember when Trump talked about his cognitive skills? So here's going against Biden, who, who has about two marbles left in his skull. And Trump talked about taking a cognitive test. What he did very cleverly is he kind of just talked about the test. And for about five straight minutes, he talked about the questions of how he answered, and then the next question, how he answered. And in the end, you're going, he just showed us. He can remember the whole test. Wow. Yeah. He wasn't telling us about the cognitive test. He was, he was, he was demonstrating. 
Mm -hmm. So Putin talked for 15 minutes about Russian history with dates, names, places, connections. Yeah. And then it hit me on the way to work. You might have seen a tweet I put in where I said, I've got this satirical article in my skull that I got to mm -hmm. write. I thought of writing a satirical article in which Biden did the same thing. <laughs> and I had this, I have this image that someone might even steal it from me based on this podcast, but and this image of him talking about the founding of the country and how, how General Mitterrand helped us in, in the Revolutionary War and how the, the famous battle of, 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 of the Gaza Strip down on the border of Mexico with, you know, with Colonel, Colonel Epps leading the, 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 what is now called the Patriot Front. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, you can write this. Oh, yeah. I, I think I can write a funny thing of, uh, that would be just every little piece of bullshit, you know, and, 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 you know, the, 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 the Medal of Honor given to, to, to Sergeant Corn Pop. And you, know, I, you, you could just go wild with this thing, right? And, and sort of imitate Putin and getting everything wrong. And, uh, but what we know is, we know for a fact, is that Biden couldn't do that. Okay. Biden could not talk about the Revolutionary War. He could not talk about anything. Because A, I don't think he ever knew it. Right. And B, he's lost his mind. C, he can't say something without overtly lying. Yeah. And so there's no chance that he could have gone 15 minutes unscripted. It certainly was scripted. There's no question he had thought about what to say. And that's why he wasn't going to let Tucker interrupt him because it wasn't important information. Right. He could have just said in, you know, in something like 1673, Russia, you know, Ukraine became part of Russia. He could have just said that. Mm -hmm. But what he did is he built a case for credibility and he built a case for and he showed the audience they didn't know what, anything about the history of Russia. So they should shut the fuck up real fast. And he showed that he had intellectual skill. That he was not losing his game. So given all that, um, that was what the first 15 minutes was. Mm -hmm. And after that, he talked about stuff. And there were some people, someone said he says he's going to talk for, for you know, 30 seconds, turned out to be 15 minutes. And, and someone else said, no, I actually think the translator mixed that up. Oh, so yeah. someone who knows Russian. I, that was weird. The Putin said, you know, oh, and, let me, let and me, this, let me like summarize like the next, whatever, 30 seconds. He, I, yeah, I, I, I right. The same thing, yeah. But, 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 but Putin knew it was going to be 15 minutes, so that's a slip. Now, you can argue Biden's Mitterrand statement was a slip because Mitterrand, Macron, but, you know, it's a bigger slip. How's that? Oh, my God. Me too. Right? Yeah. And, 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 you know, the, the, the Gaza Strip problems at the Mexican border was a pretty big slip. Um, you think they're so, doing this? Are you, are you think they're just fucking with Biden? And first of all, is that the real no, Biden, to be honest? Is that the real Biden? I, I mean, I think according that is to the some people who have been, you know, like, I don't know who have been, you've been following Pascal Najari or... You know, yeah. all these people who are researching these executive orders that Trump signed and that there's actually already a military tribunal being in place and actually all these people have been executed and uh, you see all these people with masks on. So I I'm not sure. I don't want to go into the woo-woo conspiracy field, but is there some truth to that, do you think? Or is I, that I like totally out of the... Generally, when I hear about bad things Trump did, it comes from a source that I'm not willing to take at face value. Okay. generally mm -hmm. right so if there are people i know who if they said look let me tell you the problems with trump i would listen i i'm a pro-choice guy and i listen to ben shapiro intensely Jeez. talk about uh pro-life huh. the reason is because i know he's pro-life and i also know that if there's anyone smart enough in the world to make the case that could swing me he would be the man mm -hmm. and so i i listened to it and he made some excellent points he didn't convert me but he made some excellent points that makes you pause mm -hmm. and um and so you listen to that sort of thing so now i think what they've done with biden potentially is that it's conceivable they've even done something so overt as taking him off medications because they need him to now blow blow himself up i see mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and they were hiding him but now they can no longer hide him and there's a if if someone's whispered in my ear and said look biden's not going to be the candidate inside the beltway we know this that there, there's nothing shocking about that. What is clear, though, is, is that the actual process of executing his exit, right, pulling off him, getting him out and getting the person they want in 
is a much more challenging problem. So Biden, they, can, they don't have to fake a stroke. All they have to do is not medicate him and then say, look, can't you see he had a stroke? You know, I, he, he's not working well. So that wouldn't be a problem. It's conceivable he's refusing to go. Mm -hmm. It's conceivable he and his wife and his handlers and the people who, who will have jobs for four more years, if he stays, that they are struggling. So it's possible. Or, but if he's willing to cooperate, and they probably have films of him with a five-year-old or something. So, I, I mean, they probably can get him out if they have to. Um, and and the, But then the question is, how do you do it? So if you do it too soon, Kamala becomes the incumbent. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone wants Kamala. I don't think there's hardly a black guy out in the world who wants Kamala. Um, and, and so they got to find a way to do it late enough that she doesn't become an inheritor of the position. And they got to do it late enough that in, in, in some way where they can bring in their candidate like a white knight to save the day and to have people say, hurrah, hurrah, we have a solution, not noticing that we just got duped, right? And that's not such an easy task, in my opinion. And if it's Michelle, a lot of people will be excited about that because she's not a total disaster. Now, there are people who are particularly bothered having another Obama in the White House, right? If you don't like Obama politics, you certainly don't like Michelle. Especially when you find out she's a man. I mean, or... well, there's there's that. I don't think, um, I don't think... the big Mike the big uh... Mike story is entertaining. Um, yeah. What what probability do you put on that being true? Give me a probability. You're at Vegas. There's a pay line. What's the pay oh, that's, line? That's pretty high probable probability. I mean, you know, there's just too many. I don't know, too many testimonials or whistleblowers or people who have been talking about it. And then, well, who was that lady who um, was married to Joan Rivers? Yeah, exactly. And then she disappeared. And she didn't disappear. She was. I don't know. She 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 dropped dead shortly after that mm -hmm. so you can't talk about some some issues at especially at that time probably because it was just fully taboo you know but i don't know maybe they want to make it just you know uh, socially acceptable you know it's but it's I, I don't think uh, that would think. necessarily kill our candidacy mm -hmm. in this era it's not obvious society and civilization is already so fucked up groomed and and woke and transgender brainwashed well whatever well here here's what i would say is as a person who is not a fan of 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 the extreme aspects of that movement mm -hmm. sympathetic to the people who are legitimately tr troubled by their gender mm -hmm. versus what we're seeing now which looks like a whole nother beast um i guess i would like to think that if she's a good president i don't care what she is right mm -hmm. so i think that's the high road um, people say, well, you know, she's been living a lie. I go, well, ask any gay guy who's 60 years old. They'll tell you they lived a lie for quite a while, mo most of them. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so it's hard to make that case. Um, I think it's pretty clear that Barack is gay. I think that, yeah. but, but that doesn't matter. Right? Yeah, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care. Except for know? the fact, except for the fact if, for some people, the living the lie matters to them. That's that's but the I, problem. They, it's hypocrisy. But the problem you know, is not standing yeah, up the to your is, identity. You know, I mean, this is the being problem. gay kept you out of out of politics. Yeah, when yeah, he started. True. So, true. so yeah, it's a very hard case to make. Yeah. Um, and so I, I that that's that's not necessarily a non-starter. I mean, it would make for great tweets, right? I mean, a really quite spectacular Twitter feed. Um. I don't know what probably I put it on either, but it's not zero and it's not a hundred. I know that. Um, someone sent me a moon landing video that said the moon landing's fake. Because in a podcast, I said, you know, the moon landing being fake would kind of shatter my worldview. It was an overstatement. I looked at the case mm -hmm. and it's not crazy. I don't know if it's right, but it's not crazy. It's not flat earth crazy. The flat earth guys are crazy. Um, and and <laughs> so th th my Overton window is wide open. I can consider anything that doesn't defy the laws of physics, which is why I don't sign off on aliens, because I think it defies the laws of physics. Mm -hmm. I don't think they can get here. Um, so um, so if they bring in Michelle late, I, I, I was told by a very prominent person, famous, famous person who knows her a little bit who says she wants she wouldn't mind being president she doesn't want to campaign 
mm-hmm. which could be because she's Big Mike, right? Um, so if they want to bring her in, the perfect scenario is last minute. I see. Uh-huh. And so we could be so. So the t- the trick is to have Biden bring it in for a soft landing, as economists like to say, right? Yes, he, he has to bring it in at exactly the right moment. And maybe they're starting to you know decelerate into the runway, and and so they're starting to not cover them as carefully. They're starting to not protect them. It, reporters are starting to ask them tricky questions, and mm. and that might all be orchestrated. For all I know, I I trust the media zero zero points. Are. Did you see that uh, Aaron Burnett interview of Zelensky? No, no, no. Oh, I just ignored it. Oh. No, you got to watch I thought that was like, uh, I don't know. No, I, I, no, I don't want to no. throw up or something, you know, like. No, you, got, CNN, you like, have to watch. You what? have to watch it. Is that real? Like, for real? I mean, it's, it's real. Like, I mean, and the, it's the, the post, post that I read is like, is she like seriously like begging him to have babies with him or something like that? It, 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 it's so appalling. So I guess it's possibly AI, but but no one is calling it AI. And it's just surreal to watch her. She looks like some 12 year old girl batting her eyes at the, at, at the lead singer of a boy band. I God, mean, I just it, it, it just, oh my God. so you really, but you got to watch it to, to okay, believe I gotta it. I got to take a look at it. So before I want to ask you about, I mean, you know, 2024, 2025, I mean, uh, about Trump. Uh, let me let me go back to, to Carlson and, and Putin. I mean, I had already read some time ago an article, investigative article report about Carlson, Tucker Carlson's uh, past and his family history with the CIA. Is it, was it his he, father? He had talked about, he had talked about it. Yeah, well, I know, His family's I know. connected. His family's well, been in inside the Beltway for his uh-huh. entire life. Okay. And so he apparently wanted to go into the CIA, and I don't know if they turned him down or somehow his path, life took him in another direction. But Putin decided. To th- I think that was you may have noticed that was early in the interview. Yeah, so yeah. I think, but what, what 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 do you think? What's his intention? What, 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 well, was he trying to hint at it, like Operation Mockingbird? Maybe you know, journalists, the CIA. No, I think Mason- Putin probably entered the entered the interview. Mm-hmm. knowing that there were a range of possible ways that Tucker would handle it. Mm-hmm. Now, I had great faith that Tucker would not turn it into a circus. Yeah, But Putin wouldn't necessarily be as confident. And if Tucker did, it would be very unfortunate if he wasn't ready. So I think some of the things he said early in the interview were locked and loaded to push Tucker, to say, don't fuck with me. Ah. And so he said, is this a serious conversation or is this a talking head sort of thing, right? That's mm-hmm. his way of saying, don't go there. Don't go there. Don't do this to me. If you, if that interview had been done by John Oliver, he would have butchered it, right? I mean, there's guys you just wouldn't, you do that interview done by anybody from CNN, they, they'd butcher it. And so Tucker was astute enough to know that he had to A, shut up and let Putin talk and B, ask occasional questions that are pointed. Yeah, I had anticipated it to be to behave like that. To be honest, with you. I was you know, very... confident that oh, the Tucker yeah. would handle it well. He's yeah, not yeah. stupid. I yeah. used to hate him when he was with Begala. I thought Tucker was the most despicable, wretched, mm-hmm. worthless newscaster, and I just completely changed. And I think he did. I think okay. he came to me, not vice versa. Uh-huh. Um, and um, and so so I think Putin was sparring a little early on. Yeah to get control of the flow in case it was going. And so I think he probably had those a little bit sort of in the chamber ready to fire. Yeah. And, uh, well, and yeah, just let, me, let him know, don't go there. Yeah, Dave, let me ask you, this is important because he tried to, I mean, there was a, there's a theory or there's a guy, uh, an expert, I don't know who wrote a, a thread on, on Twitter about when he, when, when Tucker talked about China, that it sounded really to me as like, oh, is he trying to, uh, what do you call it? So uh, discord, you know, like, uh, oh, you know, China is bad now and we should all, all now unite and, you know, China is the bad man. I mean, is that wh- wh- how it came over, you know, I mean, how did you perceive this whole thing? I, mean, this- I perceive that to be inappropriate, an inappropriate view from Tucker. Mm-hmm. In the sense that I don't see how you could possibly take the stance that Putin moving towards Xi Jinping is anything but profoundly logical, given what we've done. Right. So when Trump was in office, Trump said, look, we got to when Trump was running for office, he said, we have to get along with Russia, which is the the, the catchphrase 
that got me to vote for him. Mm-hmm. When he said, we got to get along with Russia, I said, he's absolutely correct. And so that's when I pulled the lever with hand shaking. I, I had that playing in my head. And then they turned Trump into a Russia collusion story, which point he then could not get close to Putin. Mm-hmm. So that put a wedge between him and Putin because he had to defend against being Putin's buddy. And that was certainly planned by the bad guys, in my opinion, the very bad people, in my opinion. Um, and so, um, so we have somehow managed to push Putin and 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 Xi Jinping together, and to and 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 the Saudis and and Brazil and all these guys into the the new BRICS, the the BRICS on steroids, the twenty countries who are now part of BRICS. And there's people who are who are laughing that off. They're going, ah, you know, BRICS currency would never be able to blah 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 dethrone the dollar. And I go, you're missing the point. It is not about the dollar reserve currency. It is the fact that there are 20 countries who are saying we are no longer aligning with the United States. And that story is a huge story. And they're in South America. They're in Middle East. They're in Asia. They're saying we are going the other way. And so does that make the dollar less likely to be the reserve currency going forward? Sure. I'm not even sure why you need a reserve currency with Forex markets. I mean, you just, you have a basket of everything, right? right. Bitcoin, I don't care, anything. Just yeah. if you buy shit in one currency, you convert it to another in a microsecond. And so you don't really need a reserve currency, except for there's one, there's one thing you need a reserve currency. And Lynn Alden said this to me where she said, you need a currency to write contracts in. So if we say we're going to buy your company for a billion dollars, mm-hmm. It's either got to be a billion dollars or a billion euros or a billion something. There might be a way to say for the such and such Forex index price, you know, there could be something like that. But so, so that throws me a little off my game of saying who needs reserve currency, but I haven't gotten great arguments against, against the idea that reserve currency is an old fashioned concept. Right. Um, So, uh, how could you not predict he would move to China for China? I, we, and Putin's dead right when he talks about, you know, you guys want to be the reserve currency, yet you weaponize the dollar against us? Exactly. You blew it. Yeah. You blew it. You bound it. They, right? and, they stabbed themselves into the, you know, I mean. You know, that, you know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of the guys when they admitted that they got Osama bin Laden by surveying the various houses using a fake vaccine program. And then also they go, wait a minute, no one's gonna no one's gonna accept the vaccine after this. Right? It's all out there backpedaling like crazy on that one, going that we made the wrong argument. Well, I'd say we blew the same thing on on Putin. We we have now forced of the three superpowers of which it was always the goal to be two on one side, we have now made ourselves the the, the loner. Wow. And I can't blame Putin. I, I can't blame him. We 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 tried to destroy him. Right. And he, he was pretty good I mean, in, in Putin, uh, like summarizing, like, what the fuck are you guys doing in Ukraine? You know, you got like, I mean, that's just the official. Uh, well, like, the catchphrase <laughs> was, don't you have better things to worry about? Right. What a great line. Putin. Putin is phenomenal at zingers. Yeah. He can really deliver the, the thing where you go, oh, that was good. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, like like he used the phrase, he kind of reiterated the phrase of, you know, what I saw were people at uh, January 6th. He says, I saw people went to Washington with political grievances. Mm-hmm. So here we're being scolded in a finger wag by a Ruski about about denying people access to politically grieving about something they really didn't like. Right. That That's embarrassing. But he, in my opinion, is correct, too. I like to describe the uh, insurrection as, as a bunch of patriots trying to overthrow the American government with their bare hands. <laughs> it just, it just, th- there is a definition of insurrection that you can pretend ap- ap- actually applies to January 6th, but most of us use a definition for which that's an absurd concept. Mm-hmm. So I'm pissed off at our weaponization of the Department of Justice. I, I, I think it's the most horrific thing that any president's done in my lifetime. 
Yeah, and 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 you know, you just accelerating the loss of trust into the dollar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, the de-dollar you're going to accelerate the de-dollarization, the U.S. Treasury, you know, uh, meltdown. Uh, I don't know what else. I mean, if, if it just well, it, I I don't trust the elections at all. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't trust pharma at all now. I consulted for Pfizer for 20 years. I was an editor of a journal. I, I can. I was on Merck's long range steering committee. I don't trust pharma now. I will never take another vaccine. No, me neither. Our daughter is not uh, vaccinated at all. So well, I bet I got triply vaxxed on COVID. I might die. I don't know, but I'm not doing it again. And and um and, and so we've 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 destroyed faith in credential experts. I think the next domino to fall will be, and it's falling now will be people waking up to the fact that the climate change story is a crock. Yeah, it's, it's crumbling crock. down. And and it's coming from really serious voices now. I mean, uh, also like sort of, you know, studies and peer-reviewed, whatever uh, you but want. But to... there, there, well, peer review is a joke. Yeah, it's As a joke. Editor, it I, I can assure yeah. you that. Yeah. Um, but but it, it's, it was coming from serious voices before, but now they're becoming hard to ignore. Exactly, yeah. And and so so, so I, I read somewhere that, it, that the support for it has dropped from 64 to 49 or something in two years. Now, I can't help but suspect that the COVID handling was so poor that people are now turning to climate change and saying, okay, what did they lie about there? Mm -hmm. Now, they've also weaponized the justice system there too, where they just ruled in favor of Michael Mann in a court case against Mark Stein. In favor of what? Michael Mann. Michael Mann. The... Michael Mann. You know Michael Mann, the guy with the uh, jockey stick. Uh, yeah, he's fraud. a fraud. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's a fraud. Um, and and he and and I mean the whole climate change story has fraud laced. It's like marbled with fraud. Yeah. I think there are climate change scientists who are very good in trying to get it right, but they are also forced to make sure they don't say something wrong. So they have to kind of keep doing their thing. Just let me do my science, and then they, you know. It's like you've seen articles about the vaccine and all the, the dangers that the vaccine is now appearing to, to yeah. pose. Yeah. The opening paragraph always so, says. I mean, Dave, I mean, yeah. the, the numbers, it's just, just staggering. It's, 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 yeah. It's unbelievably. I, the most recent number I saw from a guy who's in the Dr. Zoom group with me, who's also prominent, said that the vaccine he estimates has killed 17 times more people than COVID did. Mm -hmm. um, and you could say, I don't believe it. I go, okay, but. But you should be worried about it. I mean, you should be thinking about it. Um, so, so, um, so I think there are climate change experts who are trying to get it right. But they, if you read, let me go back to COVID. If you read an article questioning the COVID vaccine, the opening paragraph always says, you know, it's undeniable that the vaccine saved many lives. But and then they said, here's how many heart attacks have been had, right? And so they 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 have the upfront. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm on your team still, but this vaccine actually is showing some bad signal, you know. And uh, the fact that it's showing any bad signal should shock people because because the original story was zero bad signal, mm -hmm. and it wasn't it wasn't a guarded story. It wasn't like, look, the vaccine's young. It's a very personal decision, but we think you ought to get it. It it, be, it was you got it or we're going to throw you we're going to put you on an ice flow and ship you out into the ocean right I mean it, it was it was very very th there was no choice there was no open scientific debate the scientists were shut down the doctors were shut down I had a discussion with an immunologist about three days ago it was staggering that person not only did I would have been I would it would have been enlightening for me if she disagreed with me because then i would have said okay explain to me why that part's not right right because she's an immunologist she'd be very useful i was by the way by chance was reading about immunology the summer before covid showed up just by chance i was reading books on immunology in any event what i found out is this person did not even know the issues were being debated she did not know that the vaccine was causing deaths Jesus. or said to be causing deaths so it wasn't just, I don't, I don't think those numbers are good. It's, what do you mean they're causing deaths? She did not know. When I said ivermectin works like a champ. The data is overwhelming that ivermectin works like a champ. I have a personal anecdotal data point, which is a fascinating one. My son was sicker than shit. He was supposed to fly to Costa Rica that day with his mom. And he calls me at five in the morning. He says, dad, I'm sick. I can hear it. He's gar gargling on his spit and shit. 
I said, take 40 milligrams ivermectin to town. I'll go to bed. Call me when you wake up. He calls me around 8.30 that day. And he says, dad, it's gone. Oh, my God. Yeah. Right? It was that. And that's what's describing. I was like, Corey and stuff. But there's also great studies showing ivermectin works. And she says, well, if ivermectin works, why would my doctor prescribe it? I go, because she, they'd get fired. And she goes, what do you mean they get fired? Oh, my. I go, oh, God. I'm, you it's like someone. That. It's like it's like problem. someone who says, you know, there's a Holocaust or something. You go. Right. I don't know where to start with this discussion at this point. I, I'm used to arguing with people who have some foundation level belief system, and she just said. And then at the end, she she was in disbelief. She says, "Well, I'm going to ask my doctor." I said, "Barf, your doctor doesn't know what the fuck they're talking about. They're as clueless as everybody else, and they're not going to admit it because they get fired." Now, I, I'm having doctors now admit it to me because now it's no longer you go in health clinics and you see people who think the masks suck and don't want them and stuff like that. So, so it, it's people have worn down on the story. But um, so I think the climate change story is the same thing. And, and so I, you know, did you watch Constantine Kyson's talk at the Oxford Union? Did you happen to catch that? No, no. So re-listen to this. Go 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 on Google search Constantine Kaisens, both spelled with a K, uh -huh. and Oxford Union. Okay. And he gave the most brilliant 15-minute talk about climate change. Okay. I mean, right. It was spectacular. Spectacular. Mm -hmm. He's brilliant and he's funny. He and I I I I I got a transcript of it. What I had to do was just put in punctuation marks and I realized. It needed no editing. All it needed were commas and periods. It was that wow. good. And um, I sat down with him in October of this year for about an hour to chat about a bunch of different things. And I said to him at one point, I said, how long when you started looking into climate change did it take you to realize that it was bullshit? Mm -hmm. He said, oh, a couple hours. Mm -hmm. That was my experience. too. I thought yeah. the whole story was legit. Yeah. And someone finally pushed me to look into it. And about three hours later, it was clear that I had been duped. Exactly. And there's I mean, Nobel Prize winning physicist. Same thing. He said, I was going to serve on a panel. I realized I didn't actually know anything. So I started digging into it. And within a, within a couple hours, it was clear that this was just hack science. There was nothing like CO2 there. part. I mean, come on. I mean, CO2 is like. Well, but also the lying. The lying is just off yeah. the charts. Yeah. You know, so I, I have a half hour to 45 minute talk I give on climate change if someone wants to hear it. And it, it, it's it's filled with sarcasm and it's snotty as hell. And but it's it's got quotes from famous people calling it totally bullshit. And, mm -hmm. you know, I talk about the, the 97 percent consensus number. But so the bottom line is we're in an era now where credential experts have no credibility. I don't believe the election. I don't believe climate change. I don't believe the medical system works. I don't believe pharma's trying to cure shit. Um, I don't believe our politicians. I, I here's the irony. I gravitate to Putin because I believe Putin. Yeah, I mean, look at Putin. I mean, I've, I've listened to a lot of speeches of Putin, and he's like, if not one of, if not the, but one of the most intelligent, uh, mm -hmm. sober, rational, logical, and ex extremely educated, and you know, knowledgeable, you know, wise. Um, I mean, you know, he maybe he does have a past. And to be honest with you, I, I heard from a few people within the last uh, a few decades, even it's like they're saying, and I, you know, the, the, the same perception I have is like this is not the same Putin like decades ago. I mean, I don't know. Did he? Did I, he, I, I think it is the same Putin. Or no, I, no, I think he's. A so, so I have a rule when I'm trying to write about something, and when I get on a theme like climate change, I try not to read books because books are too digested. Because I, then I'm likely to just paraphrase someone else's model. Okay, then you're biased. So, the, so or, now what I also don't do is I don't get down to the raw data. So in the COVID story, there's the guys who burrow into the VAERS data and get spreadsheets. I don't do that either. Mm -hmm. What I kind of work at is the level of the the paper, the level of the, the article describing something and making the case. And and so I was writing about the Ukraine war. I think it was the best geopolitical writing I've ever done by a country mile. And I think I got it dead right. Dead right. And the, the title of my year in review is All Roads Lead to Ukraine. 
And, and I wrote about all these things that kept ending up in Ukraine, including January 6th connects with Ukraine. The truckers connect with Ukraine. Everything connects with Ukraine. And, and, um, but I didn't want to read it in a book, but I realized I needed to know more about Putin. So I read his biography. Now, it's a very strange biography. It's a picture of him looking stern on the cover. It's one of the more popular ones. And it was incredibly sort of, in the oddest way, kind of flattering in the sense that, you know, it, they're describing very clearly a guy who grew up in a tough world. And, yeah. and, but, but they described a guy who, who, for which loyalty is everything. Yeah. But it's not just demanding loyalty. It's also when he, when he aligns with someone, they know he's got their back. Yeah. So he thinks loyalty is a two directional thing. Yeah. I saw it in the documentary. Yeah. Pretty good. And so then, so then there's also this thing where, you know, people say, ah, oh, Putin's the richest guy in the world. I try to prove that. That is a statement that I cannot connect to data. Mm -hmm. He lives in a palace, but so does everyone who's the head of a country, right? So try to prove that he himself is this monstrously rich oligarch. Now, I, he's got to have some account somewhere, no doubt, yeah. for self-preservation. But Zelensky does, too. And so, you know, let's, let's, let's just go there for a second. So in any event, um, but when he was a high-ranking politician, so when he became a politician, he resigned from the KGB. This biography said, they said, no, no, you don't have to resign. He said, yes, I do. Because he didn't want a dual allegiance. Mm -hmm. And so now I've always had this theory. There's no such thing as an ex-KGB agent either. So I, it's kind of in conflict with that belief. But um, And then he, he becomes president, the head of Russia. And from that moment in the book on... It was as though it was written by a completely different author. Fascinating. Wow. And all of a sudden it became anti-Putin every step of the way. Mm -hmm. I go, did someone get a hold of that book and just edit that part? What, what happened there? And it became everything's an evil shit like that. Um, Putin surrounded himself with oligarchs. Why? Because he still has this ruling from a centralized perspective. So if you're going to rule Russia, the one thing you got to do is you got to be close to the guy who runs the oil industry and the telecom industry. And so so by, by he is going to be guilty by affiliation necessarily, given his view that that he should be within reach of all these guys. But it doesn't mean he's like a, an ultimatum to to the oligarchs like, hey, either you're going to you know uh, have a loyal, loyalty to the Russian federal whatever. You know, Russian. I think he did. So yeah. when he gets asked about, for example, why did you arrest Kodakovsky? Mm -hmm. It sounds like a sort of a pointed question, right? It's like, oh, how do you explain that? And he said he robbed Russia blind. Now, I am fairly confident in surmising that there's not a single billionaire in China who made it legitimately. Yeah. So if you point it to a billionaire, I'll show you some guy who robbed Russia blind. Mm-hmm. Um, when Putin was a high-ranking politician, but not yet head of head of Russia, his wife got sick and needed an operation. He had to borrow money. Show me a politician in the United States who'd have to borrow money to pay for a, mm -hmm. a wife's surgery. They're all doing just fine and dandy. So I tend to do the whataboutism thing on uh, opponents in this debate. What about is a lot of people? Ah, oh, that's just what about is. I go look. What I'm trying to point out is that you're you you are a hypocritical piece of shit. Let me just call it that. If you want to talk about all the people Putin killed, let's go to the Clinton body count. Where were you when Vince Foster was getting killed? Did you talk about that? Did you talk about all the guys who are trying to out global pedophilia problems who are getting whacked? Exactly. Have, have you in any way? Where were you when we were bombing Yemen? Where were you when we when we were trying to get into a war with Syria for no good goddamn reason? Where were, where are you right now as we're trying to pick a fight with Iran for no goddamn reason that I can I maybe maybe there's a reason. Maybe you know the reason. You certainly know Iran better than I do. But but I look at Iran and I'm going, this is a country we should be careful with. And I've been told that this is not bombing Iraq. This this is the and so if we put three soldiers in Jordan and they get killed, that's collateral damage. Yeah. 
You don't you don't go after a country because three of your soldiers got killed in a place that's inherently dangerous. Mm-hmm. You shake it off. You say, sorry, it happened. Now, let's get back to like the, 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 the interview. They talked to Tucker, tried to get the guy sent back. Tucker overplayed that one, in my opinion. I would imagine that Putin is correct in the sense that the guy, the, the Wall Street journalist who's sitting in a Russian jail is not innocent. Yeah. And he laid it out. I mean, he said he broke the fucking law. He's, 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 I know. Now, we don't know if that's true, but okay. I can point I can point to hundreds and hundreds of guys who are strutting in our jails who mm-hmm. I don't think are guilty of anything either. Mm-hmm. January 6th outdoes that by a country mile. And then there's uh, Gonzalo Lira in, in, in Ukraine who is yeah. spouting off for a while. And he wasn't even a big player. He seemed all comical at some level. Mm-hmm. But spouting off about how this Ukrainian war is stupid. He was be- basically saying that we shouldn't be here, stuff like that. Zelensky picks him up and kills him. And our State Department did nothing. Yeah. You know that we could have made one phone call and say, uh, look, Volodymyr, Volodymyr, whatever he pronounces his name, you got to send Lira, Lira home. And he would have sent him out. They didn't do anything. But, Jesus, right? but we wanted him killed. Mm-hmm. That's what scares me, because we seem to be able to whack people, not just because you say, well, we kind of had to whack that guy. I can believe in that tough world of bare knuckle politics that there's guys occasionally got to take out. I, it, it's just, I'm. I, it, it happens. It's like an Italian mob fight, right? Sometimes you got to do it. But but I think what we do is we take out guys to, to make a point who really shouldn't be taken out. So I think the January 6th um, show trials were very Lenin-Stalin-like show trials. And, and, and none of the people deserved what they got. I don't think I, I imagine there's a couple of people who deserved what they got, but not many. When, when Biden bragged about putting people in jail for a, a sum total of 800, 870 years, I was so disgusted by that sack of shit. I, that, that's, you know, Biden should walk in front of a truck. I, I just, it, 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 it's a horrible moment in U.S. history. Even if they deserve to be in jail, it's a horrible moment in U.S. history. But it's much more like the World War I veterans who all got shot trying to get their pensions in the early 1920s. Yeah, yeah. It's much more like that. And so, so for Biden to brag about putting those guys in jail, now they're talking about going after guys who didn't even enter the Capitol. I go, Putin is a cupcake compared to you guys. That, that, that we're back to the weaponization of the Justice Department. To have the Attorney General of the United States stand in front of Congress and say that five guys were killed on January 6th. Merrick Garland, eat shit and die, you sack of crap. I, I just have no patience left for any of these guys. Mm-hmm. He knows full well that five people did not die. On January 6th, one of them died that night for reasons that are very mysterious. The other four committed suicide. How many how many cops do you think were at January 6th? If you had to take a guess, just looking at films and stuff like normal 150, cops? maybe no. how many were there that day? How many how, how many were engaged in the January 6th moment? 150, maybe not many. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. So let's call it three or four percent of them committed suicide. How is that possible? How is that possible? And they go, oh, it's a horrible day. And I go, cops face shit like that daily. Daily, they're pulling people over that could kill them in a moment. Four cops did not commit suicide. Four cops got whacked by somebody. I'll bet a paycheck they got whacked by somebody. They knew something. They did something. There's some reason why they got whacked. And... And remind- then you saw the pipe, the pipe bomb story. You saw yeah. the pipe bomb story. Uh huh. Reminds me of that. So what was that? There's another interview with you where you talked about the Frazzle drip video, where I would say, let's say, allegedly, whatever Hillary Clinton with this um, other woman, where I don't know. It is. It's just so fucking disgusting. I don't know. Cutting off uh, some girl's face and uh, putting it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, of all the investigative or, or detectives and police people who investigated Died. Uh, nine out of 12 or something like that, or so nine, nine cops got suicided, actually or? got to, got to see the contents of Anthony Weiner's laptop. 
Right, exactly. Yeah. The material that was on there was said by one who was being interviewed. Now, again, this is coming off the internet. This could be all bullshit. Right. But this is what this guy, this cop was being interviewed. The nine cops who saw it are all dead. Now, I don't know if that story is true, but I know that there's nine cops with names and faces and and widows who are now dead. And they saw the contents of the video. And the guy who, who saw it and gave an interview before he got whacked or died or whatever described satanic cult shit that included right. Hillary cutting the faces off kids and walking around with them. And you go, that can't possibly be true. That can't possibly be true. Well, I have been for the last calendar year decided this was the year to write about pedophilia. Yeah. Now, here's why. As I stare at geopolitics, as I watch leaders in Europe let millions of North Africans into the continent, knowing it doesn't work well, right? The, 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 you don't have to be anti-Islam to recognize that when, when the two cultures mix, it's oil and water, right? right. Their belief systems are so different. Yeah. And so I think it's pretty clear from European, Europe's history is, is that, 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 that Islam and Christianity geographically are a tough combination. This is not like Irish and Italians. This is this is a very different world. Mm -hmm. And then they left them on. And I don't know why. I had a long conversation with the guy from the Netherlands yesterday who's going down the same rabbit hole. And he confirmed something I read. And that is that, that Sweden is now considered the second most dangerous country in Europe. Yeah. And, and I go, how did that happen? And we do know how. We don't know how. So, yeah. so, so, so I look at all these things being done by politicians that don't make any sense. Why would Biden leave the southern border of the United States wide open? Why would people, do, why would Prince Andrew do an interview for, for one of the major networks and look totally unprepared on the Epstein thing? Why, why would he not have been prepared or why would he have not skipped the interview? If he looked good, you can imagine the interview being a repair job. He looked awful. Um, and I came to the conclusion that these people are controlled. So it starts with the Epstein story. So I'm going to wildly guess that Epstein probably had a thousand major political figures totally compromised due to his, his network. CEOs, presidents of countries, you name it. I, I think his network's huge. We're never going to see a list. We're never going to get a credible story out of that because those are the people who rule the world. Yeah. But it's like an astronomer looking out into the galaxy and noticing things are acting funny. You go, why, why is it acting funny? And then you realize there's a black hole. Mm -hmm. You go, that explains. So what, the question is, what explains behavior? Why would Biden do stuff that is so, so against sort of our basic principles that you say, look, what he's doing is treasonous. I, I believe Biden has done treasonous and things that are so treasonous. Now, I have no trouble with people who hate Trump and thinks that the things he does are awful, but you can't find a treasonous argument in there, in my opinion. And um, so why would Biden do that? Why do leaders do what they do? I don't understand. And, so I, and then I got onto this thesis that that they're all compromised profoundly. By yeah, even beyond pedophilia. imagination. I mean, this is not just like, you know, prostitutes or whatever. Or yeah, well, yeah, this is, or, or this is not, no, this is, this we're talking is not about like 17 children. year old girls. We're talking, about we're children, talking right? children. We're right. talking about sacrificing children in yeah. satanic ritual stuff. So it's I've dug into this. I mean, and Epstein, when, as you know, it's just one example and a, another. And he's a relatively clean example, example right? Exactly. He, he's an old school example. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, so what you find when you dig into this world is that there are people talking about it. And here's what I like to say to someone who's having trouble even fathoming what you and I are talking about right now. Is I point out that the official numbers, whether they come from UNICEF or the World Health Organization or various organizations with ab abuse and missing children in the title or whatever, is that some, in the world, somewhere between one and 10 million kids a year are disappearing. It's a huge number. And so what I like to do to get someone to pause long enough to say, okay, I have to think about that now, is ask them, where do they go? A million to 10 million people, where are these kids going? What you know is they're not going to trailer parks to guys who are living on welfare and being ring fenced away from elementary school because they're sexual predators, things like that. 
You don't buy a kid cheap. And and I've I've gone through a huge, huge volume of the, the literature, let us call it, on pedophilia rings. And one of the things you find out is there's things that I just never would have known. One is I used to think pedophiles were soloists. They're not. The networks pr- provide everything. The networks are professional, sophisticated. The brainwashing techniques to do things to children are sort of military grade. Yeah. Um, I think it's worse in Europe than the U.S. because I, I think it tracks uh, royal bloodlines more. Yeah. So I think Europe has has the network of and, and, and then you find out that a lot, a lot of kids who are not technically missing are part, part of multi-generational satanic cults within families. Right. And to be honest with you, I mean, I heard uh, many years ago from uh, people who, who tried to, you know, uh, follow up on this is that Belgium, you know, uh, the king, Bel- who, yeah, the king who had right. abdicated, uh, he actually, the, the, the court in France wanted a blood test from him. This is what I, he- I had heard. And it was at that moment, like shortly after they wanted a blood test, a DNA test from him, he abdicated. And I don't know, you know, maybe he was just under immunity or something like that. He, he just, you know, vanished. And then his son stepped in, you know. So I don't want to know how many how many corpses of children are, you know, buried under his, uh, you know, palaces of uh, whatever properties. Mm. Well, so here's what I think you find. First of all, the numbers are sloppy because... Because the numbers include, you know, kids who just disappear, you know, hit the streets, things like that. Uh, the numbers also include uh, basically slave labor. Mm-hmm. And, and as much as that's horrible, to me, it's not an interesting topic because, as I said at one point in a paragraph, writing about this has been nearly impossible because the emotional component of it Um Turn of the century, we were putting kids in factories at four and five years old. That's trafficking children, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And and so the, the the child slave labor is a problem by in polite company, but it doesn't start ringing alarms in your head. There's a certain logic to it. Um. But there's a million kids, and they estimate that maybe 60% of them are for sexual purposes. Uh, I've listened to interviews, voice dubbed over of traffickers talking about the, what's happening, what's not happening. And one of the things, one of the guys said, for example, we don't pick up kids off the street in the United States. That would cause way too much pain and suffering for us. He said, he said we don't need a whole community looking for the kid. We don't need the FBI looking for the kid. We can grab tons of kids from places where no one will complain. So, for example, one of the great hubs of child trafficking is um, Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Now, I think if I were to put my spin on it, I, I think Ukraine has enough third world flavor that you can do shit like that. Yeah. I also think that um, in a trafficking world where Presumably, different kids have different value. I would think that probably, although you can get unlimited number of kids from Haiti and Africa and stuff, I suspect that in this world, blonde-haired, blue-eyed kids would bring the best price. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So Ukraine would be a great place to, you know, if I went looking for a wife, I'd head to Sweden, right? <laughs> Just the blonde-haired, blue-eyed chicks there. Um, so, so, and then the. the Crises are a big part of it, where a crisis during World War II, you know, they sent the trains into London, they shipped the kids away to get them out of harm's way, totally legit. Now when they do that, the kids don't make it home. It's called harvest season. Yeah. So when there's a war in Ukraine, and they try to say that Putin's been picking up kids, why the hell would Putin pick up kids? Explain to me why Putin wants a bunch of orphans, right? Putin was finding kids on the battlefield who had nowhere to go. That part of the story I buy. Exactly. But yeah. also they're harvesting kids from Ukraine. Uh, Haiti's got a big deal. So I was, on a, I was on a Zoom call with a group that I go to. I'm going to give a talk at this week, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a Zoom group of doctors, lawyers, a guy from the NSA, various interesting characters that started on the COVID story. 
Mm -hmm. We're trying to piece together what the hell is truth and what's fiction. And um, we invite in speakers twice a week. I, I drop in. I'm, I'm a non-dependable participant. But we invited a, a guy who's essentially CIA. He's not CIA because he, he's a caseworker for the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. But it's basically DOD's CIA equivalent. It's intelligence. And he came and I was Googling the shit out of him to make sure he's legit and stuff like that. He's a lieutenant colonel by name, but it turns out he says, I actually never got the rank. That's just my cover. He says, that's, that's, they, I just wore this. I'd go on TV, I'd wear a uniform, you know, look good. And he was everywhere. He clearly was what he said he was. And he, he told us great campfire stories about things he did and who he talked to and, you know, battling with Rumsfeld over some issue and things like that. Um, we got to the end. And I said to him, I said, uh, um, his name is Schaffer, Anthony Schaffer, I think it is. Um, S-H-A-F-F-E-R. Um, I said, I'm interested in child traffic, pedophilia. And he starts talking about Epstein right away. He goes right into Epstein. I said, no, 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 no. I don't care about Epstein. We all actually do at some level understand Epstein. We know that Epstein's client list would be unbelievably provocative if we could get our mitts on it. Um, no, I said, let me let me come at I'm I'm worried about I'm much more interested in the much darker side of it. And I said, so let, let me come at this a different way. I said, let me ask you a simple question. Does the Clinton Foundation traffic children? And he said, Absolutely. Yes, yeah. That's, that's right? information, yeah. And mm -hmm. and and the Clinton Foundation is does traffic children if you read this very off-off-Broadway yeah. literature. It's the and, and there's this famous woman named Laura Silsby who got caught twice trafficking children yeah. in, in Haiti. Mm -hmm. And she was in a Haitian jail and made some phone calls to the Clintons. And next thing you know, she got out. She now doesn't have the name Laura Silsby because she got married and she's now working for Amber Alert. See. Is that another... So if, if you... Well, I think, I think if you find an organization that's big well-funded and charged with overseeing children mm -hmm. you will find the roots of the, the pedophile network so i think those organizations are all run by guys who are overseeing because like for example the international association of missing and abused children they get plenty of money stuff like that they never catch the pedophiles you get headline saving of kids that were found in some box car or something you know they never find the pedophiles. They never get to the get to the final consumer, which is really where the problem starts. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you find there's people in there. You go, oh, you know, that's a little suspicious. That guy had been charged with pedophilia, and now he's vice president of that organization. What's that all about? So, so then it gets. And there've been so many times where I said, I'm, I go, I'm too deep. I, you've somehow gone off the rails. This can't, this can't be a productive line to follow. You got to be wrong. Well, if you had said to me at that moment, who's the most famous Satanist in the world? Mm -hmm. I would have said without hesitation, Marina Abramovic. There's pictures of her oh, sitting on the Rothschild. Huh? Uh, there's some pictures. And with, and with Hillary. And with Hillary, yeah. And with and with a lot of famous Hollywood types and stuff yeah. like that, and there's pictures of her with a goat's head that's been skinned, and there's pictures yeah. of her sitting on sitting on piles of animal carcasses, and there's pictures of her with, you know, art on the wall made out of blood. And it's just she is a absolutely out in the open famous Satanist. Yeah, she just got appointed about three months ago by Zelensky to run the school system in Ukraine. Oh my God, I heard that. Jesus, this is this is so beyond. I couldn't believe it. And you it. sit there and you go, ha, 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 if this was a made-for-TV movie, no one would watch it because you know that's not believable. It's not credible. <laughs> it's getting so fucking grotesque, uh, David. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like they're doing it on purpose, like in our faces, like just to, I don't know, just to show so us. So the worst thing you can do in this pursuit, the most grisly thing is to, is to find interviews of victims 
Anika Lucas. I was one of the first ones. Anika to... Lucas. I was one of the first ones to have an interview with her. She told oh, me the, God. the only reason, by the way, I think she's alive because she never, she never ever mentioned names or whereabouts or anything. None of them but, do. But, but, but none but, of them do. Yeah, but she said, you know, she was sold. She was sold at an age of, I think, six by her mother, I think either by parents. But or by see, that's family. always a strange thing is she lived at home yeah. and was networked traffic through the network during, you know, after school and on weekends. Yeah. And that was and called you know, the VIP it. elite pedophilia ring. It, it, like she said, it was all, you know, prime ministers, royals, presidents, CEOs. Two time prime Hollywood. minister of Belgium. You mentioned Belgium. See, cesspool. It's a cesspool. So then, so so I found a site that's called Fifty Voices of Ritual Abuse, and and it's fifty people who've been interviewed. Some of them have their faces covered and their voices dubbed. One of them's a guy who talks about discovering that his wife was the victim and that his wife had been doing it to his his children and he never knew it. And so, and they all tell similar stories of of torture that would make Jeffrey Dahmer's grimace. About having to, like Annika Lucas, there's these horrible moments where she talks about how she had to participate in killing another kid. She talks about one time she complained when she was with a bunch of other kids about being hungry and they brought up a carcass out of the freezer that was a half rotted kid and made her eat it. All the kids eat it. And she says, no matter how much salt you put on it, that's just not a good experience. And and they're usually sort of reassembling their personalities from multiple personalities yeah. that emerge to protect themselves. They all tell stories of ritual sacrifice, say, and they, they're all they all were brainwashed. To brainwash this five year old kid is trivial. It's trivial to make a kid feel like it's their fault, to make the kid tell the line, to say, "Look, if you don't do what you're told, we're gonna we're gonna sacrifice your brother," things like that. Exactly. They all tell these stories that that the average person would hear the story and say. That can't possibly be true. See, that's the problem. That's the core problem. People like average people. I mean, you and me and your people who are like deep into this. We, I mean, we, we face like, I mean, I, I saw the fucking Satan, you know, in my whatever psychedelic, you know, thing. And I'm like, no, you know, it's like, anyways, that's my own trip. But, but this is the problem, Dave. You know, it's like people cannot even imagine. They can't, they can't comprehend and yeah, and did you read about the Franklin scandal? You must oh, got to the Franklin yes, scandal. Yes. It's been, the Franklin scandal is kind of a Rosetta Stone because they did a good job of revealing it. Mm -hmm. And what you discover from the Franklin scandal, it's not about it's not a, it didn't seem like a particularly big network. But what you get out of the Franklin scandal is how much the authorities pulled out every stop to destroy the people who are trying to reveal it. The FBI did, the courts did, the, the newspaper did. Everyone was trying to stop the scandal from unraveling. And, and, and it's a very compelling story. It's a Rosetta Stone for me. But, but so then, so then, um, but then the question is how many? So I was watching one day an interview of a guy. Now, I don't know his name. I've got the link. I save them all, right? He was being interviewed by people that I recognize. I don't know their names, but they're like these one of these interviews where you, you recognize people, maybe higher tier cable interviews. I'm not mm -hmm. even sure if it's an online interview group or uh, I think it looks like a TV group where you go to higher tier cable and they're interviewing someone. You go, this is sort of half infomercial, half news, right? You, it, it's kind of ambiguous what it is, but I recognized it. And the guy had a company in which he sold blood for blood transfusions oh my god are we talking about adrenochrome that, uh shit uh, adrenochrome and it, it was called young blood how and big I is watched, this, how big is this business sort of i mean a so-called business well, so here's the problem if if, uh, if you believe me on the million plus people disappearing i think it's hard to make an argument that that the demand for kids for sex is that big yeah for our that's, listeners that's, and viewers um it's uh the blood sucked out of children who have been like horrific, tortured, like uh, tortured, and they. Right. What, what, what do they like? So the claim is now. Here's the thing: is you don't even have to believe the science of it is true. You have, yeah, you only have to realize that if people think it is, then they do it. So there, yeah. there's people who will eat all sorts of shit because they've been told it's good for them. But the adrenochrome story is: is if you torture a kid to ungodly levels of pain and suffering. And then at that moment, drain their blood and get a transfusion. It, it's rejuvenating. 
and this term. this talk show term. talked about it. Yeah, but with a yeah, high yeah, addiction yeah. rate, like like addiction. Like, well, I'm not even sure. I believe the science. I do believe that there's probably people who think it's true, right? So it doesn't have to be true. Yeah, exactly. And some guy said, "Well, why don't we make a dream? Why don't we yeah. make adrenochrome? Let's do a startup." And I go, "I'm just not going near adrenochrome. No, thank you." Um, so adrenochrome is a real chemical. So the kid's adrenal gland is going wild as they're being tortured. So it is. It would not shock me if it was true that the blood from someone who was under extreme torture is going to have a really different biochemistry than a normal blood. Now, the interviewers, these seemingly credible interviewers that I've seen, you know, talking about ladies' handbags and stuff, you know, other times, you can watch them dancing around, not asking the question about where's young blood come from. And one of them at one point said, well, you know, I'm sure it comes from legitimate blood bank sources. And I'm going, no, because kids don't donate to blood banks. And then I read an article that he wrapped up that startup and he started a new one that now is not just young blood. You know, it's, I, and I, I'm going, holy shit, they're mainstreaming adrenochrome. And then, of course, you bring this stuff up. So here's the problem I have. I talk about this. So in some sense, I'm openly taking risks. But I'm leery about writing about it. I'm going to write it. Mm -hmm. What I'm leery about is putting it out there. For a host of reasons. There's, there's, you know, like Liz Crocken. Yeah. That's Liz Crocken's cool. a former news media person who was fairly well connected in the news media, who is now battling this story every day. But whenever you see people in this game, you kind of say, okay, but, but who are they really? Yeah. Right. So Liz Crockett is basically now Liz Crockett.com. You know, I mean, she's got a whole Liz Crockett industry. And I'm okay with that, but you know, Ballard, the guy in Sound of Freedom, mm -hmm. I believe the Sound of Freedom is a paradoxical combination of things. I believe that this basic story is correct, even though there's a lot of fabrications in the movie. But I also believe that Ballard is also an opportunist who spotted a way to, to, yeah. to shill. Yeah. And who funds but the think, movie, by the way? It's again, well, it's one famous, of them is the powerful XM, people, a billionaire. He's also like really like, you know, very con I mean, controversial, <laughs> beyond controversial. And what you notice is that movie doesn't go near the question of who's getting these kids. Exactly. Yeah. Now, the people like Annika Lucas and Kathy O'Brien, and these are famous victims, but mm -hmm. there's so many out there. Um, they don't name living people. No, never. No, they would. And, 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 and so... And then the other thing you find is, for example, it appears as though Hollywood is hopelessly corrupted. Totally, totally. So oh. then the question is, how is this possible? How do you corrupt all these people of power? And, and I realize no, you and other people have made this. I've since realized other people have made the same conclusion. You don't corrupt powerful people. You corrupt people before you give them power. Mm -hmm. And if they're uncorruptible, they also don't get the opportunity. So I believe. It's that level of extreme. I believe there's people in Hollywood who agree to be corrupted mm -hmm. because they've been promised opportunity. Lady yeah. Gaga basically said that. Um, several Hollywood actors said that. You got the whole, the guys who came out and are calling pedophilia out. And, and, and guys like uh, Corey Feldman's doing it, but he never names names. Now, my fear personally is, so I'm not saying anything that's not already on the internet. I don't have any inside information. I'm not about to spill the beans on something that's not known. Mm -hmm. But I could imagine a situation where I'm reading the room wrong and that Liz Crocken is limited hangout mm -hmm. and that she is a controlled bleed of information, sort of like a, a, a regulator for the SEC. Mm -hmm. where you go, okay, they're going to regulate us, but they're not going to do any damage. Right. Although Liz Kraken looks like she's doing damage to me to people, but um, but I'm worried I'm reading the room wrong. I can imagine someone saying, okay, that's fine. We can have Liz out there doing this shit. We can't have a Cornell professor doing this. Mm. And I could imagine getting whacked, not because someone's pissed or getting in trouble, not because someone's pissed, but because they have to send the message that if you mess with us. No matter who you are, you know, when you have show trials in Russia, it's not for the people being killed. It's for the people who are alive. Right. 
So if Dave opens his big mouth too often, which I, I'm obviously doing right now, but it, you know, podcasts are kind of, you know, kind of transitory. Mm-hmm. If I write a paper and ends up as zero heads, it becomes a little more permanent, you know? And um, I could imagine someone saying, you know, we got to, we got to, we got to show the world not to do that. And I could imagine suffering. So first of all, for your re- viewing audience, I'm not suicidal. If I should, d- I find she commit suicide. It was not me. <laughs> um, it never works though. So, so there's a famous Hollywood producer named Cappy. Yeah, and you can you can follow up on him and see the movies he did and all sorts of stuff. And and a guy named um, what's his name Davis, John something. I'm forgetting his name. I should know it. Paul, but another producer who's got movies you recognize mm-hmm. under his belt. And Cappy came out and said, "Let me just let me just call for what I." What I see, he said, Tom Hanks is a pedophile. Yeah. Oh, Two Kevin, weeks later. Talk about love, Kevin Sp- I mean, look at that. Look at that. Well, the space, witnesses- we already know. We already know, Kevin. Exactly, yeah. I mean, but, but, I mean, but this guy, Cap- journalists, in, in, raw journalists, Cappy- Witnesses have been, uh, you know, uh, suicided. I mean, just, just I mean, uh, so, in a, a, so a large number. A large number. Yeah. The other problem I face writing about this is that, let's say you watch a two-hour documentary that's off off-Broadway on the web somewhere. You know, there's some skull and bones at the top of the website. You, you go, you're on your own. You're, you you got to bring your own personal filter. No one's doing it for you. But there's things there you go, oh, that is really hard to deal with right there. But but it's it's always the whole story, which all the different topics are interlaced in the same. So to write about it, I have to pull all these independent sources apart into their components and reassemble them. And so it's also, even if it wasn't an emotionally problematic thing to do, it's just, it's like, it's like mixing spaghetti, taking spaghetti and separating the strands. Mm. And, um, and so uh, also, you know, if you write about a hundred people who are a serious problem and one of them you're wrong on, it would not be irrational for that guy to sue your ass off. Yeah. So I, I've talked to people about, you know, according to the law, are you, if I say so-and-so is a pedophile, that's defamation. Mm-hmm. If I say the pedo hunters out there say so-and-so is a pedophile, I think that's not. Mm-hmm. Here's the, where the problem gets dicey. I also don't think the guys that January 6th were guilty, but they're still in prison. And I don't think Mark Stein should have lost a penny for Michael Mann, but he still did. Mm-hmm. And so the current justice system that you and I now know, you no longer can say, well, I'm on the right side of the law, so I'm okay. There's nothing that says you can't be destroyed by the legal system right. if someone wants to. That Alex Jones was $970 million, Right. Fox settling with with Dominion for for three quarters of a billion dollars when in fact it never they should never should have gotten a penny. No, they can destroy if you if you want if they really wanted to. But the thing is, my question is, you know, Dave. I mean, um, now before because because there's we need to somehow dot you know connect the dots because uh, you know with Putin, uh, Trump because you know let me connect those two dots right okay, now okay because he knows much more than he pretends to, or or you know at least uh you yeah know, it, this it was a, it was a g-rated interview yeah yeah now if he had gone darker he would be more dismissible mm-hmm. so there's you know if someone interviews me and i want to keep my credibility i'm going to probably stay away from my dream from right um who are the p- two most powerful nationalists in the world? It's Trump and Putin. Mm-hmm. Who are the two guys getting the most guff in the world right now? It's Trump and Putin. And so, you know, the, the woman in Italy, uh, um, Georgia Maloney. Mm-hmm. Maloney, is that do I have the Maloney? I think it is. It's an Italian Maloney, not a, not a Spanish yeah, 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 Maloney. Yeah, yeah, I know what you yeah. When I listen to her, I just laugh my ass off. I'm thinking, oh man, I would never want to be married to her. She would rip my ass off. I mean, she when she goes at Macron, oh my God, it is a sight to behold, right? And these people are a problem. Victor Orban is a problem. Mm-hmm. But they're in many ways my heroes because they're defying the system. Victor Orban is one of the is one of the few politicians that I 
sort of trust. I'm sure there's things he does that I would hate to sign off on. But you will not find a politician you can agree with everything, maybe short of Ron Paul. So. So, Dave, when we got all these structures within the <laughs> so-called check, the so-called not not really existing checks and balances of uh, you know executive, legislative, executive, judicial, and then the media, and then you know we got Hollywood, you got all this. Well, the media is gone. The media is gone. The media is gone. But it, it means like you know prosecutors, lawyers, uh, judges. Mm -hmm. I mean, if if like a certain degree or the, on the highest level, they're all blackmailable, extortable, blackmailable. Right. I mean, right. what do you do? I mean, you, you got to play 4D, 5D chess. This is, I mean, I, this is a wishful thinking I have. with. Well, then the question is, the question is who's actually running the show? Who's running the show? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you say, okay, if they're all blackmailable, obviously it's, it's not a, uh, just a, a fair fight. It's not like two gangs fighting because you'd see fatalities on both sides, right? And somehow they seem to be ducking the problem. Now Fannie Willis, Will's down in Georgia, seems to be getting beaten up pretty good. But uh, I think she was a sitting duck. I think she was doing unbelievably. Uh, she's one of those ones who is too stupid to be in the position she was in so she couldn't behave herself, right? Um, but um, I, in my Zoom call, there was, there was a guy one day, we didn't all know each other. There's a lot of doctors, virologists, this group, this worldwide group, organized by a doctor in England. Um, and one day there's this bespectacled guy and he starts talking about Hegelian philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I go, wow, Stephen, what's he talking? What's he doing here? At first, I don't know why he's doing it. And then he starts making sense. And I'm going, he's got, he's got a point he's making here. Pay, stay with him. And someone interrupts him and says, Stephen, are you up? philosophy professor or something he says no i'm a lawyer by training but i used to work for the nsa and 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 then he proceeds to tell us that you know we, they analyze the arabs and the, to understand arab culture you have to understand hegelian philosophy mm -hmm. it's like if you tried to understand the radical left you would have to study all the vocabulary and wokeism shit that someone like james Lindsay studies Mm -hmm. So I said, we had to know Hegelian philosophy like the back of our hand to understand it, even conversations. And uh, so one day we're talking about the vaccine or something, and we're talking about a they. I said, Stephen, we can call it, say they. Who, who, who is they, in your opinion? And he said something profound. He said, I, I don't like to name a name. And he said, the reason is because is if I say, by example, you know, Bill Gates, created the vaccine, caused the problem. He says, you get to, that, I'm giving you a license, a dangerous license to stop thinking. Because mm -hmm. you think you've now got an explanation when in wow. fact, you just scratched the surface. Mm -hmm. He said, I like to think of it as a, the they as a self-assembling oligarchy. Now, an okay metaphor is a school of fish. A great metaphor is a starling murmuration where they all fly together in these magical patterns. And no one starling is leading that group. Mm -hmm. And so they have common interests. They, they all have, share a common goal, and they, they, they work as a group without knowing who they are. So, so I would argue it's kind of like the CIA. I think the CIA runs a sleeper cell model. I have made the argument that the CIA is actually, in fact, I asked that the CIA analog this question, but I, I, I'm... I'm not sure you can say with confidence it's the CIA works for the United States. Isn't it like I, more interjurisdiction? I mean, uh, you know, like well, I, I think it's an Mossad, international MI five, MI six. I mean, this is like everything is like you know. There's well, I no... think it's a crime syndicate that yeah. has a budget inside Washington. Mm -hmm. But I think they're they're rogue at this point. I'm I'm guessing that there's guys in there who do try to get things right for the United States. The Federal Reserve does not work for the United States at all and the way you know that is because the, the bo their most important members have branches and and major business in every country of the world and then you have to go back to the owners to the true owners and controllers which is jp morgan and and, and, and Citigroup and, and things like yeah. that and, and the point being is jp morgan might be domiciled in the united states but yeah you, you really ought to pause if you start calling it a u.s bank and so 
Ironically, Jamie Dimon seems to be one of the most sort of U.S. loyal leaders of these banks. You get the feeling that Jamie might make the right call. I mean, he's obviously a tough guy and obviously, you know, exploits his power like crazy. But you do get the feeling that in a pinch, he would side with U.S. of A., right? Mm. And the others I'm not so clear on. Um, I'm not even clear on him, but... Um, so, so, so I don't think these guys are really U.S. based at all, but they might be loyal to, say, the West versus the East. They might be loyal to they might be loyal to America versus Europe. You know, I do podcasts with Tom Luongo and he's got this sort of Davos Asia yeah, yeah. U.S. model. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's a very complex world. And he knows it way better than me. It's a sufficiently robust model that he can kind of hang all his observations off this structure and it fits. But and I've asked, I said, but are you sure the structure is right? Exactly. Yeah. It's a good model, but I, I, what if you're hanging ornaments off the wrong tree, right? Um, so, so, so I don't know who the they is. Um, you can go down that you know, 300 people rabbit hole where there's 300 people who meet in secret and run the whole world. I, that, I don't find that constructive. It could be true, but I don't find it very constructive. Even, um, you know, even to be honest with you, the Rothschild, even just, just, I mean, there are definitely in some kind of power position, but there are some people, faces, names that we have never seen or heard of. And that's, you know, uh, yeah. like nobility so, or, but it's like someone really said that that the leaders of the world do not have Wikipedia pages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I don't know what to make of it. And it, it might not even be that sinister. It might just be humans being humans. True. But, but that, that idea of not naming names, I expanded to a much bigger thing. I said, be careful, pay attention to what you're doing and ask, is it causing me to stop thinking? So for example, if someone calls me a conspiracy theorist, I come right back at him with both barrels and say, are you so fucking stupid as to think that men and women of wealth and power don't conspire? Are you really that stupid? And they'll say, well, no, no. And I go, then why did you just say that? I make them pay for that because they're trying to shut free speech down by calling me a conspiracy theorist. And of course, people pay attention to this shit know that that started with the CIA in a memo in 1967. Um, there's a thing called Hanlon's Razor that said, don't chalk off to, to nefarious behavior, that which could be attributed to, to uh, incompetence. For all I know, that's a CIA-derived maxim too, right? Exactly, yeah. It's a lot easier to say, yeah, oh yeah, Biden did it because he's dementia. Yeah. Like make you really so Kamala Harris. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kamala Harris is a great example. Mm -hmm. I'm confident she's stupid. If I dismiss her because she's stupid, then I stop thinking. Mm -hmm. Because she's giving speeches that are stupid. Her speech writers can't be that stupid. So why are they writing stupid speeches for her? Yeah, this is my suspicion. Is they're doing it on purpose? It's like in our, I don't know. It's, it's, I don't know. It's, it's, I don't know. People become so dumbed down, and because they believe every. I mean, look at this. You talk about any any topic. I mean, people within our family, friends, or you know, circles. You know, people. I know people. It's just, it's mind boggling. It's like Jesus. Well, what's really divisive is there's the those of us who pay attention, those of us who don't, and the wedge between us is getting huge. Huge by board. It, it used it used to be that people worried about whether your daughter or son married someone within your religion, mm -hmm. right? Uh, now it's within your political party. It's it, it if if if. If I was single and I, I was dating someone who was seriously left of center, it wouldn't work. Yeah, no. Now, my wife is left of center. She's an environmentalist and stuff like that. She's totally rational, in my opinion. But she's also starting to understand me better. Mm -hmm. So one day at Thanksgiving, my wife was talking about how, you know, I kind of miss my old husband, the one who wasn't paying attention. And I said, but Candace, is, here's what's driving me crazy. Cra I was trying to trying to explain to her and at one point my son said what dad's trying to say is what if he's right right and now my wife is looking going holy shit he's right oh 
And I'll show her something that just would be unimaginable. And I'll say, look at this. Yeah. And she goes, my God, that's stupid. And I go, yeah, why is that there? But see, this is, I mean, I'm, to be honest, I feel lucky because me and my wife, I mean, we've, I mean, we're like from the beginning is like, you know, <laughs> we're like so deep into every fucking rabbit hole there is. And, and, you know, any topic, any values, any, you know, or, or the way we, you know. We, is she Iranian? What she, what is, no, what she's is her? Austrian. She's Austrian. She's Austrian. Okay. okay. And, you know, we don't, you know, we haven't vaccinated our daughter. It's like every topic. She's like actually a big fan of yours. She said, I should ask, you know, this and this question because you, you, you don't hold back. She said, you know, oh, she said, yeah. that's great. No you know, she said, you don't hold back. You really, you know, you just say what, you know, what you're thinking and, you go deep into the rabbit hole, you do your research and you're, you know, totally credible and, you know, makes me happy. You know, we are on one wavelength, you know? So, um, well, I'm just amazed again, how man. many people I now run into. I had a friend call me from high school. I've talked to probably five times since high school. And we started talking. I was staggered by how overlapped we were <laughs> and how things he was worried about. And I go, I really thought that was just my sick little world. And he was worried about the pedophilia, and he's worried about the various things. And I, I and and then he, I, he said, he said, I, I, I've heard that you do a lot of podcasts. So I sent him a couple. Sent one from Marty Bent, mm -hmm. and uh, he said, my wife and I watch. He says, it is so clear you and I have to talk more. Wow. Mm -hmm. And and uh, my colleagues don't want to talk to me because they know I'm way over armed, and they're just they're just not ready, you know. Like that colleague who was the immunologist who, who didn't know anything about COVID, we were too far apart to even have a discussion. Yeah, yeah. But but one day I was in the in the grocery store and one of my other colleagues who was very improbable to do this. He's a guy I go I never would have believed he would do this. He comes up to me and says I want to talk. And I said why? What about? He says I now understand your worldview. See. And he started talking about all yeah. the things. Once once you go down one of those rabbit holes, the whole house of cards seems to Jesus, fall. That's the problem, Dave. And this is this is what I'm saying is like, um, you know, I mean, I, I you you know, I you know what I'm talking about. It's like you you both both and I, you know, we 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 have empathy. I think we are fellow human beings, and I and I I truly understand and empathize with people and with their, their our family, friends, or circles. It's like. This is exactly you. You said it. It's like a house of you know of cards breaking down. It's like your whole world for you grumbles down. And that's why the red pill, blue pill model works yeah. so well as a metaphor for people. Yeah, I never used to use it, but I, I've now finally memorized the red pills, the one we took. Um, I used to say which pill was it again? I took. Um, <laughs> and then I've got this belief that Hollywood's job is to fictionalize reality. And and so they make movies like Eyes Wide Shut. I think one of them is, um, which is not the director's cut. Yeah, right. Um, you don't want to know the, how much they cut off from Kubrick's. Uh, I heard it's like fifteen minutes or something. I, it was a pretty lengthy version, and he built all that into the whole fucking. You know, but here's what I think they're doing. So, for example, like The Good Shepherd, uh, Born Identity. You know, there's all these movies that that you go, oh wow, how prophetic. I actually think what they're doing is creating a Hollywood version so that when I when I say that, you know, MK Ultra creates these these as fucking with people's heads, they go, oh, oh, that's the born identity. What they've done is they've taken my concern about reality and, and converted it to a fictional movie plot in their head. They've anchored to a fictional plot. And I think that's what they're doing. I'm waiting for a movie about the Las Vegas shootings. There's got to be one out there one of these days. The Las Vegas shootings is one of the most perforated stories I've ever covered. So 500 plus people got shot. And no aspect of the story holds together. None whatsoever. You, you Once once that house of cards fell, it fell in such bold ways. The whole story fell apart. Yeah, and uh, and I was writing about it, and YouTube's were disappearing as fast as I could find them, and and it was I was really chasing yeah. the yeah. story, and I don't know what actually happened. Although I think I am John Cullen's um, theory that the Saudis did it is is not bad. I think I think it's an interesting theory, but but his model does include all the chaos going on at the ground level that can't be explained. He's got this double helicopter behind the mandalay. Um, what I do know is that it wasn't Stephen Paddock. Mm -hmm. 
It wasn't. He got the first bullet. There's nothing about the story that works. I think all the shooters, possibly not all, but I think all the shooters are all connected through. I don't know if it's the way to do it, but we'll call it MK Ultra. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know. Kaczynski appeared to have been MK Ultra. Charles Manson is connected to MK Ultra. Jack Ruby is connected to MK Ultra. Mm -hmm. um, and and I th I think the I think these shooters are laboratory experiments for the CIA. Yeah, I think they train them. Um, and when I was chasing down the Paddock story, um, at one point, ABC wrote an article about how his, and in the article I said his, his hard drive was missing from his laptop. And in my usual sarcastic way, I said, oh, don't you hate it when you lose your hard drive, right? But then this elite news organization said, yeah, but it's not that weird because they named about five other shooters and said theirs were missing too. I go, I'm supposed to feel good about that, <laughs> right? Five, five shooters, five missing hard drives? And, uh, and, you know, and then stunningly sort of up in your face stuff like the, like the, the January 6th yeah. Lenin tribunal destroying all the records. And even text messages, I've, as I heard, and all the how, FBI how, text messages or whatever, you know. Like. Preserving data is one of the fundamental jobs of government, right? It's, it's, they're not supposed to do that ever, right? And it's one of those things that's like you're supposed to keep a record. It just and they so they destroyed all the data, and I'm going. And the fact we haven't seen the January six tapes, they've got, and it's troubling. They went through Tucker's hands, and we haven't seen them. Now it's like but McCarthy so, and obviously now faces David. I, I don't know, Dave. Uh, it's what are they trying to achieve? I mean, it's like uh, you know, like it's like a fuck you or to the people. I have a simple know. answer to that one too. So I've done part of my deep dive is studying authoritarianism. Not there's people who are experts, you know, but. Um, you now you read books like uh, Live Not By Lies about the Soviet Union. You read books by Hannah Arendt about the, about Germany. That's a tough read. I don't recommend that one. It's too hard. I, I have a colleague who's a Nobel Prize winner who spent two months in an attic in Germany, two, two years in an attic in Germany. And he said it was a tough read. This guy's one of the smartest guys you ever saw. Um, so, so Hannah Arendt, uh, Matthias Desmet, um, Eric Hoffer, um, you read about these movements, and there's a recurring theme, and that is is two things that, that people feel while authoritarianism is emerging. And one is confusion, mm -hmm. and the second is demoralization. Yeah. Then and the thing I, I bet that, that I, I'm, I'm going to safely surmise that that describes you. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. And the ultimate objective or goal is control, of course, right? I mean, control. And, and, but it's a, it's a kind of a a global brainwashing effect. Mm -hmm. I'd love to have beers with someone like Mark Crispin Miller mm -hmm. in NYU, who's a propaganda expert. Mm -hmm. So I got approached by a guy from Stanford. I can't remember his name, so I'm not hiding it. I just don't remember it. And he wanted to do a survey of how chemists deal with certain aspects of data treatment, stuff like that. And at first I was going to blow it off because I thought that this is some bullshit thing. But he in, in his email, I said, here's my cell phone number if you want to talk about it. I go, okay, this guy's serious. So I Googled him. And I and I uh, I found a video from 2016, I think it was, in which he, he talked about, maybe led a discussion about climate change, but how the media and the two political parties respond to it. Mm -hmm. And I, he was really trying to dissect it into how does the right respond to this when the left says this and that. It was an interesting analysis. I could tell from his presentation that while trying to stay neutral, I could see he basically bought the story, the climate change story. And so I wrote back to him after watching this. I said, well, I do have to confess to you that I watched your 2016 video in which you talked about response to climate change. And I gave him about three paragraphs describing that rabbit hole and said, so I'm going to confess that I, I think the whole thing's bullshit. And he emails me back and he says, well, I went down that rabbit hole later too, and I totally agree. Now, this is a media expert. Wow. 
So now he said to me something about how he was thinking that he would help by showing how much bullshit that 97% consensus stat mm-hmm. is. Yeah. And it's it's a complete pack of lies. The 97%, Absolutely. anyone who's read how it was done, you realize anyone who quotes that, who knows, anyone who quotes that's either ignorant, they don't know where it comes from, or they're a liar, they know where it comes from, and they're willing to use it anyways. Because it, it turns out they looked at thousands of papers, threw out all the papers that didn't say anything that, that they thought was meaningful, got down to 79 papers, and 77 of them said it was a problem. Right. Out of thousands. So as Michael Crichton put it, he said they were able to somehow grind out from a 0.4 percent response, 97 percent consensus. Mm-hmm. That's what Crichton called it. That's and like uh, he thought if he, if he could fry that, it would have an effect. And I said, no, Steve Coonan has written an entire book. Steve Coonan, former physicist at Caltech, former provost, former Obama chief science advisor, wrote a book saying it's a lot of crap. And that's having no effect. So I, I, I don't see how you dealing with that number is going to help. So we are facing a serious problem because we're, we can no longer even get, we can no longer use facts as the currency of the discussion. Speaking of currency, I'm going back to pedophilia. So you go, are we alone in the pedophilia story? Well, we had as our Zoom, one of our Zoom guests is Archbishop Pagano. Oh really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well 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 you had Annika Lucas, so we're both doing pretty well here. Um Vagano, high ranking archbishop in the Vatican, came out and basically said the political leaders are all making their decisions because they're all capped to, captured by pedophilia rings. He he just explicitly said that. Then you find the former secretary general of the UN, can't remember his name, was quite a ways back. He referred to pedophilia as the currency of geopolitics. Exactly. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And and when you start running into that shit, you go, oh, my God, I'm not nuts. I, I, but then the question becomes, am I crazy to go down this rabbit hole because it's not making me happy? Well, this does. one's... This I mean, one's been tough. Us, I mean, I sometimes I really have to let it go because it just uh, and my wife. It's uh, I mean, we do you know we do you know w- read and watch documentaries, all kinds of you know interviews or with you and, but sometimes you just you gotta let it go because you're going you uh, just going crazy. So so so, so with I Palestine tend... and Gaza, you know, the, it's like you know how many children. Oh, I don't t- I don't touch like... that one. I don't touch that one. Why? Why? Tell me. By the way, uh, there's no way to win touching that one. Mm-hmm. I, I don't I don't have enough to bring to the story. So I was happy to jump in on Ukraine because I thought I, I, I really looked at it and said, I think I can bring something that other people are not bringing. I took the 40 guys who were writing legitimately, honestly about Ukraine, mm-hmm. doing great work, and I consolidated their voices into one voice and said, here's what's going on using all this. So they were not they were not cooperating with each other. They were independent voices, and I made them, I correlated them. Um, and I can't bring anything to Israel, Palestine. I also know that both sides are beyond crazy in defense of their world. With both sides, you mean the, um, what, what do you mean, the Palestinian? Well, look at the Palestinian protests in the United States. Okay, gotcha. Now, now, yeah. now, what I'll tell you is when you see those angry mobs in the cities pe- protesting in favor of Palestine, I would say probably most of those people can't find it on a map, can't find right. the Gaza Strip on a map, right? But, but I, what I do talk about with respect to that story, I won't talk about who's guilty, who's innocent. Mm-hmm. I can't even profess to know that. I can't profess to know what Israel should be doing. Mm-hmm. I can't profess to know what Israel's done to the Palestinians, what Israel's done for the Palestinians. It's just so complicated. And and what I also know is that um, the Jews have been defending themselves since the dawn of time. I I do not need to step in the that in in the front in front of that. It, it's just not when when uh, Kanye got in trouble for saying something bad about the Jews. Um, and I'm actually breaking a law I'm about to say. 
Dave Chappelle did a did a stand up skit on it. He said what Kanye didn't understand is there's two words you never put together in a sentence: the and Jews, and that's absolutely true. It, it, it's very rare that when you put the and Jews together, that sentence is going to go someplace good. I think we're doing fine today, but it's because I know, yeah, I know, I know. The danger. But if but, if, but if would I, you I, between Jew, Judaism, I mean, you know, I mean, like, uh, oh, well, uh, oh, we all know and that, Zionism. Zion, you know? Zionism and Judaism are different. There's a Venn diagram yeah. overlap. I, I just, I've had. I've had great nuanced discussions with a friend of mine, um, y'all know David Einhorn, who while Jewish and beyond smart, really is capable of looking at a complex problem and not get getting tangled up in the emotion of it. Mm -hmm. And so we, I, I'll talk to him about it, especially because he can bring the Jewish view that I might miss and things like that. Um, but these are discussions that, that are very difficult in public. And, and that particular one, I've just said, I'm not going there. So I've made a few public statements. I've talked about the risk that it poses to global um, tranquility. Yeah. Right? There's no question when you see violent protests breaking out in every major city of the world over this conflict Yeah. that is dangerous, and it seems more dangerous than Ukraine to me. I see. Yeah. No, I was just talking about you know the 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 the, the, stag the, the horrific you know number of children uh, just being you know I totally get it. bombed down and and you know we talk about like kindergartens where you know people are just seeking shelter and it's just being bombed down. You know, it's like children. I, I mean, know. You know, and this is what what I'm... what I what I can't profess to know. What I can't profess. And, and as I've said to people, I said, look, right now, Israel is losing the optics war. Mm -hmm. Right? The optics are bad, yeah. I think. I, I don't think. What I can't profess to know is what what is Israel's best play. I don't know if they have to do this and they have. For all I know, Netanyahu yeah, said, look, we're going to look bad. We're just going to have to knuckle down. I, I have no idea. Or whether they thought, oh, we're going to get away with this. And they didn't. I have no idea. I just hope they don't call, you know, they don't trigger, a, you know, they don't uh, do a false flag or Netanyahu. You know, I, I totally, to that's the scary part. That's you know, And I do not want to have that trigger. You don't want to have a with war with the Middle East with Iran. I'm telling you, this is not know, years ago. I know. I mean, Iran is and, not the same, you know. And, and I will say public i've been willing to say this publicly um if you had asked me prior to the event prior to october 7th imagine that hamas drops 800 guys into israel mm -hmm. how long would it take israel to clean that mess up and i would have said i don't know three minutes they were pre i mean come on it's just it's, 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 so, it's, so the so the point the point i i would think Israeli grandmothers would be able to take out 800 Hamas warriors, right? I mean, uh, my respect for both the Mossad and the Israeli army, not whether they're good people or bad, but just their skill mm. is off the charts. Yeah. So for Hamas to get into Israel and, and, and romp around Israel for eight hours is unimaginable. No, everybody. And said. what's really unimaginable is that they could get out with hostages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and so the, so so that's about as credible as nine eleven having our entire air force up in Maine for nine eleven. You know that sort of thing. Okay, so 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 it's clear to me that Israel let it happen. Yeah. And and there's a woman who who actually was a an officer on the the group that manned the wall, and she did a podcast with Brett Weinstein. And they were speaking cryptically, but they both basically said there is no chance yeah. that you could plan anything inside the Gaza Strip without Israel knowing it. They have eyes and they ears could have everywhere. A mouse, you know. That's I mean, right. That's right. So, so Israel let it happen, and then friends will say, "Well, why?" And I go, "Watch what they do for the next two years. That'll be your answer." Yeah. So right. What, what nine eleven. Nine eleven. Watch what we did. We moved military troops into the Middle East. Right. 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 So so watch what they do. And that will be why. Mm -hmm. Now, did they miscalculate? You know, I believe Putin miscalculated his first response in sure. Ukraine. Sure. But he also adjusted. Mm -hmm. Israel, I think, may have miscalculated. I don't know. They may have said, look, we're going to take a beating. But this is what we have to do. It's not going to look good. I, I just don't know. And so and someone listening to this, I've been pretty you know, noncommittal. 
but there's people from both sides who could get mad at me and say, well, you know, you're supporting a Holocaust. Yeah. You're supporting mass killing. You're support uh, No, I'm not. What I'm saying is you guys have to argue amongst each other. You're not going to get me into this one. Right. And, and, and if they say, well, you like the guy in Germany, you put up with the Holocaust in Germany. I go, you're going to have to live with it. Then I, it's just, I'm not getting into this one. Right. And, um, yeah. And, and I am slowly tiptoeing in. Mm hmm. Because it's impossible not to, because it's a geopolitical event of great importance. But um, for quite a while, I said nothing. The first day it occurred, I put out a tweet. I said, if you're expecting me to tweet about this event, you're dreaming. What I will say is that um, the propaganda will be huge. You should put your default setting on doubt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the second thing I said in public is in front of my class, I said, as some of you may know, the world changed two days ago. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm pretty sure there's people in this room that are on both sides mm -hmm. of this issue. Mm -hmm. And I said, what I'm going to urge you to do is to be kind to each other. Mm -hmm. That was my second statement. And then for quite a few weeks, I said nothing. And now I have conversations with you about why I don't say much, but you know, no, it's I'm still right. not. Yeah. yeah, I'm still not saying who's right, who's wrong, who's guilty, who's innocent, who's immoral, who's not. I don't even know if I understand Israel's relationship with yeah. the Gaza Strip. I, I, it's just, it's not just you know, talking as a human being. I don't, I don't care whether it's Israeli children or you know, or any. I don't care. Yeah. I'm not you know, ethnic, religious, or anything. I'm just. I'm just, we're just suffering, you know, with. with well, but, and, and when I get people, especially with the Ukraine thing, where people talk about the horror of Ukraine, and I'll say, you know, Madeleine Albright was asked if killing 500,000 yeah. kids was worth it, and she said it was. And I go, was, yeah. mm -hmm. where were you when that thing got posted on Twitter? Jesus Christ, yeah. Right. right. So I call it the sanctimony industrial complex where mm -hmm. the people will, will get all sanctimonious. And say, they'll say clearly Putin was the aggressor. I go, no, there's nothing clear about that. Mm -hmm. There's nothing clear about that because clearly if Russia put troops along the Mexican border, we would clearly flatten Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are we the aggressor? It's not clear. Mm -hmm. Right. So on a positive note, I mean, let's wrap this up. I mean, I don't want to take too much time, but um, let's talk about Trump. Just, I mean, do you think it's realistic that Trump, you know, is playing some kind of the higher chess game, and he's, he, or, you know, with overwhelming uh, support, he's going to become president, and um, I don't know, and many, the military is going to take over and uh, just just drain the swamp, and why well, is that? Just uh, oh, know, I don't, I don't think he's going to do. I don't think he's going to do that. Okay. Um. It's a very real question of whether they will, no matter how they have to do it, let Trump do, become president. So I, I can't rule out the possibility that if it looks like he's going to get it, they'll shoot him. I, I mean, you just you, you, there's nothing off the table, mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. um, if somehow they coax him into putting Nikki Haley on the ticket, then I will be so troubled. But Trump's son said he would do everything within his power to keep that from happening. I'm guessing that means no. Mm. Um, Trump has grown up a lot so Trump 2016 wanted his name all over everything in a shallow narcissistic Trumpian way I, I did even at the time though recognize that here's a guy who knows how to build buildings and get things done and therefore you know he's way more qualified than many of our politicians but he was also so idiosyncratic I think Trump has done what I call weaponized narcissism mm -hmm. so i think trump has realized that the to truly achieve greatness which he wants to do <laughs> um his narcissist side wants to do that he has to actually be great mm -hmm. so i think he's now trying to figure out how to be great because just having his name everywhere is not enough now for him i think he's got to be great he wants to go down in history he wants to be Alexander the Great 2.0. He wants to be that guy. So he realizes he's got to do it. Yeah. He When he took over in 16, he couldn't trust anyone. Right. 
But do you think legitimately that he was groomed? Uh, not groomed, but you know, like prepared no, I don't think so. His position? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think people thought he was going to win. Okay. Gotcha. I think he was a Manchurian candidate or something. I, 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 I no, I don't think. I don't think he thought he was going to win. It was clear that right up to the last minute, no one thought he was going to mm-hmm. win. Right. So yeah. I. I think the Democrats wanted to go against him because they were confident that that would be farcical and that Hillary would be put in position. I think that was probably the play. And then reality started to set in when he mowed down. One of my colleagues referred to it as an incompetent campaign. I said, the guy just mowed down 13 contenders with an attack that is brutal by any metric in politics. Mm -hmm. And you're calling that incompetent? I mean, that was an extraordinary performance of savage politics. And, you know, Scott Adams analyzed, was spending a lot of time analyzing Trump's speech. And he says, if you look at how Trump speaks, it's brilliantly logical. Yeah. It's, he says strong opening word. He, he breaks it right down into sentence structure and says, this is unbelievably good. Mm-hmm. And so Trump was grotesquely underestimated. Yeah, he was he was laughed at and they they didn't understand. It's like Cindy Lauper in her funny voice as a singer. She says, people don't laugh when I sing. Um, and so I think Trump now. Knows what he wants. He now he knows what he wants. Mm-hmm. He knows where the spoons and forks and knives are in Washington. He knows who he can trust. So if he becomes the nominee, I will be shocked. Yeah. If his cabinet, his inner circle doesn't include Michael Flynn. Okay. Maybe t- maybe Tucker. And a special special segment of the military thing that they got his back. I mean, this is why I invest. Well, I, mean, I got to figure that with Flynn in there, I do think Flynn's legit. I'm not sure I, about I Flynn, this, to be honest with you. I think he's a dubious character. But uh, the, the, this is what I read from other people who are investing. That's the problem. That's now, the problem. I think I think Flynn got sandbagged by being too close to Trump. I see. Flynn, by the way, has gone deep. He, he, Flynn and you and I could have a conversation. Flynn tweets about Pizzagate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Flynn this morning tweeted to Rudy Havenstein that he wants, he likes the way Rudy thinks he wants to hear more. Yeah. Interesting. That's quite a, did, did, quite a moment. Flynn for come Rudy. from the counterintelligence, uh, some kind of, you know. I have no idea. It, Flynn could represent that, that. You know, some there's these QAnon like videos, which I don't even know what QAnon is. So there's that, but there's these QAnon like videos that make it sound like that there's a this army of good guys mm-hmm. who are amassing and they're ready to take on the swamp and clean it up and bring America back to greatness. They, they, they really, you can hear the music in the background, and everything. So it's just you can watch these videos about the how bad the world is, but then they finish with this this unbelievable picture of Trump and his army, and they're going to come in and save the day. And I go, I think you've gone too far. Uh, um, I don't think it's that clever. But but Flynn represents sort of that, hmm. I think. Uh-huh. Okay. And, and so I think Trump can now figure out, has had plenty of time to figure out who to trust and not to trust. One of the epiphanies I had, which I feel stupid taking so long to have it, I used to marvel. I thought I thought Pence would be the front runner, mm-hmm. and I thought he'd be the no, front he's runner. A, he's a fucking traitor. No. Well, yeah, but but it was that last day, yeah. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. where he turned against against Trump, and and therefore he lost the entire MAGA vote. And I said, okay, he's not. But it's worse than that. I, I used to marvel that he would he could somehow survive a Trump administration with with no dents, no scars. Mm-hmm. And it clicked only recently that that's not even possible unless he's on the other team. Mm-hmm. So I think I think Pence was a plant from day one. And heaven only knows how much information he transferred over to the other team. Right. The whole way. So I think Pence was a spy for the deep state. Do you think the Trump whole way was naive in a, in a certain way, or did he let it, did he let all these people like filter out, you know, like ed, ed, like intentionally letting in and then filter them out? So now he's prepared for the next crusade. <laughs> well, so when I ask people to tell me what did Trump do that was terrible, I mean, none of the shit that he did is terrible at the level that his ah. opponents say he was. Right, none of it. 
but a lot of it's also stupid. So, um, so for example, people say, well, he didn't pardon the J sixers. I go, they didn't get identified till after he was out of office. So Mm -hmm. maybe there's such a thing as a blanket pardon, but that would have been a reckless thing too, because the dust hadn't settled. You didn't know who was actually guilty of something. (laughs) You also would not have known that they'd, they'd crank out 870 man years of prison time. Mm -hmm. That was not seeable. That, 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 that is just staggering to everyone who cares about that shit. Um, I have colleagues who say, you know, no, you do the t- crime, you do the time. I go, okay, next time you get a ticket for doing 45 and a 35, I hope they take your license for 10 fucking years. Because you did the crime. You knew you were speeding. Right. right? Um, so, um, so I, I don't know what Trump the next president would be. One side of my brain says he might get down to business to try to achieve some important stuff like build the wall and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Somehow patch up the Russian thing, stop the wars. I think he's, I do believe that the Ukraine war would go away immediately if Trump got president. Right. Well, that, and there's 500,000 Ukrainian mothers who would like to vote for Trump right now. Mm -hmm. They, they they can't be happy about what happened. Um, Another lobe of my brain wants to see him get in there and go a little Green Goblin, Leroy Jenkins on it. Say, okay, well, first thing, I want to see day one, blanket pardon for everyone for January 6th. Mm-hmm. If he doesn't do that, if he doesn't do that, then then he will disappoint me. Um, I have a vindictive side of me that wants him to take out, wants him to exact some revenge. It's not that that side of my brain says that's the best way to go. Mm-hmm. But I have a frontier justice streak in me that's pretty deep. I think a culture of honor that Malcolm Gladwell writes about. Yeah, I mean, look, his, look what what they've done to him. I mean, Jesus Christ, all these tr- right. trials, these phony trials. And, right, I mean, right. So there it. are people who deserve yeah. to be beaten up badly. Mm-hmm. It's just not clear whether that's the right approach, but... Imagine you were a father of either A, a son who's rotting in prison because of January 6th, or B, the father of a daughter who showed up, who's 15 years old, who showed up home with a double mastectomy and, and, and chemical castration under her belt without you signing off on it. Jesus, yeah. And this is happening. I, I would have to ask the question what should that father be thinking about yeah mm-hmm. and revenge would be it yeah Definitely. so if i if, if my if my daughter came home with a double mistake to me oh and i was God. not included in that i don't even want to know I, I would do a sex change on the doctor yeah with a rusty butter knife and yeah. that would be the start and if if i did it only meant that i didn't have it in me yeah and people, right, meant, children don't understand that, to be honest with you. I mean, you know, I mean, we have a but, but this is why this is insane, because there's now yeah. I did a poll. I did. This shows you that we're being duped. I did a poll that I included at the end of my annual write up as a foreshadowing in case I happen to find time to write it up. I'm, I was going to go with the gender story. And there's multi layers. The first layer would be if you really have a gender identity issue, you have my sympathy. It, it, life can't be easy, right? And then I was going to go, and then I was going to work my way into um, uh, gender transitions of kids and just flat out denounce it, just flat out go at it with everything I got, both barrels, and and transgender athletes in women's sports. Just go at it to say this is insanity. Mm-hmm. I did a poll on the transgender athletes in women's sports. And I said, no waffling, no offense or buts. Should biological men be able to compete as transgender athletes in women's sports? Yes or no? And I did the poll, got 5,000 votes on Twitter. 97.6% said no. So the actual issue is resolved. (laughs) We just can't seem to get it to stop. Yeah. And it's because that 2.5%, that 1.5%, whatever it is, um, is somehow controlling the narrative. 
Uh, is it is it really th these two or three percent, or is it like really the people who are I don't know in these decision making? Well, if you can vote anonymously, it would be ninety seven point six percent, according to my poll, who'd say no. Which means, therefore, that you can sympathize with a transgender athlete, but women fought like crazy to get their sports supported and funded, and just for people listening who think, well, you know, it's not what he speaks of. I coach two collegiate sports. I know sports, both of which have male and female components to them. I was a head coach of gymnastics. I was assistant coach of Taekwondo. This is and, 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 and so I, I have this unbelievable support for women in sports. Transgender athletes in women's sports is not support for women's sports. I can't it's even a believe horrid what idea. Talking about it, I can't even believe we're discussing even. But, no but for example, one of my Twitter followers sent me a DM. He's a very wealthy trader. You'd know his name. I don't know if it's public what he's doing, but he is supporting the costs of Riley Gaines to have a security detail. She has to have security guards on her. Jesus. Now, when I got canceled in 2020 by, it was AstroTurf. It wasn't a grassroots cancellation. There was something so methodical about it. It was during lockdown and 5,000 kids, you know, signed a petition to get me kicked out of Cornell and stuff like that. So it was, a, it was a mess that lasted a few weeks. Fortunately, I had some trustees in my corner um, and other things. So I wasn't going to get fired, but it was a miserable experience. Um, but what was scary about it, I didn't worry so much about the Cornell kids. I got a lot of death threats, but it was a time when Antifa was active. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if Antifa would find a way to show up at my house. Mm -hmm. So I slept with loaded shotguns and I put a knife in every room, a steak knife. So that if I somehow got cornered, I would have something. Mm -hmm. I was totally emotionally prepared. Someone wants to break into my house. I will kill them. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with that. Maybe I'm full of shit. Maybe when it got to that moment, I just wouldn't have the balls. But morally, emotionally, blowing their heads off. No qualms. Daniel Penny, when he choked that guy to death on the subway. Forget about the fact that it didn't look like he killed him. It looked like something else happened. Mm -hmm. I don't care if the guy died. Been arrested 44 times, walked into a subway and said, I'm going to kill you guys. Daniel Petty should kill him if he has to. And by the way, if you look at people under those conditions where you're restraining them, there's a thing called some sort of delirium. I can't remember the adjective that goes with it, but where you become like superhuman strength, your adrenaline kicks in, and that's when the person trying to restrain you gets hurt. Oh. So if you take physical action against a person who's threatening, you have to be ready to kill them. Yeah. So I opened up a discussion on that topic to two two things. My wife several times. My wife, uh, my wife several times ripped into someone, and I, I go, Candace, she can't do that. So we're at a demolition derby, and she ripped into some guy with tattoos all over him about how he's sitting in my son's seat. I said, after I said, Candace, the guy's not going to beat the shit out of you. He's going to beat the shit out of me. Right? You can't do that. Especially a guy who looks like that. But that guy's not going to give a fuck about beating the crap out of me. And if he beats the shit out of you, I got a real problem. And then one day she did it at some fucking beach at some point. She's ripping some guy and he's fat. And I could probably outrun him, but she couldn't. And I said, Candace, let me lay this out for you. You pick the fight. If I have to deal with him physically... My only real option, in my opinion, is to get the first and 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 every subsequent punch in. Mm -hmm. There's no chance I give him a chance to to get the first punch in. Yeah, and and I probably have to beat him into a coma. Yeah, to make sure that he can't get to me. Yeah, it's if, you ever, watch a, you be, if you ever watch, if you ever watch, if you ever watch, to be very fast. Yeah, it's, if you ever watch a street fight, these guys don't go down easy. Yeah, and um. And I said, so I could end up in prison because you lipped off to some guy. Mm -hmm. And that's my only choice. I'm not going to be chatting with that guy about why I shouldn't do something. Yeah. Once I realize I'm in trouble, my goal is to 
get that first really savage blow in. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I'm going to be the aggressor. Hello, Putin. Right? <laughs> and there's people listening to this go, this guy's a sick fuck. I go, don't push me then. <laughs> and here's here's what I'd like to see happen. Some guy does a gender transition on some 14-year-old. It's happening. We know that. Yeah. Against dad's wishes, that sort of thing. I would like to see a dad take it out on him. I would like to see the other doctors thinking of doing such stupid fucking stuff. Yeah. To look and go, you know, this is risky what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. There are dads out there who don't like this. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Yeah. So so I think that there's a there's a reason why frontier justice exists. Yeah. Because the alternatives didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So if that guy can cut the tits off my daughter without telling me. Jesus the Christ. system has broken. Yeah, the system's totally broken. The, the legal system is no longer adequate, and so yeah. you go to you go into lawless mode. Mm -hmm. You make the guy pay. Yeah, because what do you and do you make, as a civilization society when everything breaks down? I mean, there is the only way is, is you. you and gotta, that's why weaponization of the DOJ is the most heinous thing Biden could have possibly done, and he did it. Right. He's weaponized the Department of Justice, which means now we are lawless. Mm -hmm. And so to me, Biden is treasonous at so many levels because he doesn't, in, in the most fundamental way, represent, support our system. Right. And Trump did. A, there must be a critical mass of people like waking up. It's, it's impossible. I mean, it, would it be, I don't know, five Well, when that's Lenin... Enough. That's when Lenin took power, when Stalin took power, what percentage of the people didn't understand what was happening, right? Mm -hmm. Does it mean that the 5% can't, you know, Saddam, right? Remember when he did that decimation of his Senate? Mm -hmm. There's a videotape where he calls all of them together and, and he starts hauling, he hauled about 10% of them out of, which is a decimation, out and they went to places that you would never want to go. They never reappeared. And you could watch people sitting in the room shitting their pants. But they didn't do anything. When Mohammed bin Salman was, there was an attempted assassination against MBS, which is actually was aided by Khashoggi, which is why he sliced him and diced him into pieces mm -hmm. and filmed it. Mohammed bin Salman photographed that Khashoggi treatment invited the royals into a room locked the door showed the video basically said and they got they got to watch Khashoggi get tortured to death yeah. and he said don't fuck with me mm -hmm. and guess what they don't they, they don't fuck with him history shows that's the most probable path so when someone the other day said you know well the violence the, the, what they're doing is evidence they're losing oh no 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 when Stalin got violent, he was winning. It took 70 years to undo Stalin and Lenin's victories. One of the funny things about that, I have another great book for you. Um, the White Pill by Michael Malice. It's a history of the Soviet Union. What he doesn't do is make the mistake of getting tangled up in all these Soviet names that could make it a boring book. He, he's able to tell the story and not lose a relatively ignorant audience, while at the same time, you get really get the sense he nails it. Yeah. What's the title? And w The White Pill. The White Pill. By Michael Malice. Uh -huh. What he describes is, we all know that Stalin killed 40 million, but we don't know how. I mean, mm -hmm. you might, but I didn't. He didn't just line up 40 million and kill him, right? He made... Malice basically does an excellent job of describing how Stalin, with brutality and a lot of killing of people, got the Soviet society to totally destroy itself. Wasn't it like majority of like fame and starvation? I mean, what or all sorts of things? But he got people to turn. He got people to turn on each other. Easy. He got kids to turn on their parents. Mm -hmm. People to protect themselves would turn into anybody. He would kill. And it's, it's, a, it's an odd thing because if you look at Hitler, by comparison to Stalin, he makes sense. Hitler identified a, a community that he declared was bad, and then he killed them. 
Now, no one would agree with them, not in this era. But there's a call logic to identifying a comedian and then killing him. Stalin just killed people. And there's there's no patterns. Mm -hmm. But he got society to just it, destroy itself in so many random ways, so counterproductively. And 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 as you're reading Malice's book, and as you're reading Eric Coffer's book, and as you're reading all these books on authoritarianism, you can't help but say to yourself, don't let this happen here. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's some of us who see it happening here. In different colors. Yeah. <laughs> and and it, it may look sort of civilized, but you know, during COVID, as you watch the Australian guys act like Nazis, and you watch Adhern in New Zealand act like a, a little Nazi. And you watch people say, look, you know, if you don't get vaccinated, you should just be left to die. Mm -hmm. Things were said. There's a gradient of response during COVID. I know I'm schizophrenic here. Um, there's a gradient of behavior in COVID that went anywhere from people who took the high road, who gave up their job out of principle. You know, and I go, yeah, but I got to feed people. So that's not going to happen. Um, to those who were mass murderers, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a lot of people who followed along and did things they knew were wrong because the choice sucks so bad. So if you're a doctor, you say, look, I know this vaccine's got risk in it, but if I don't sign off, I got to give up my job and I got kids in college. And, and you can't criticize a person for weighing that thing and making either, making the decision they made. I, I just don't think you can. There's people say, well, yeah, no, that's not the morally sound thing. I go, in biology, you don't make morally sound decisions. You make, you, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's genetics at that point. You do what is in your best interest. Mm -hmm. And if being morally sound is in your best interest because the way you, you're wired, that's okay. But um, but then there's the guys who did shit that were really just bad. So is you know Jimmy Kimmel stands up and says, if you don't get vaccinated, just you know suffer wheezies. I think he said, you know, yeah, you know that that I will not forgive someone no, who did no, that. We don't forget. No, we don't. No, I've no. No, gotta be held accountable, especially on that level. Where... And so far, they have not. Exactly. Yeah. And there's things I, I feel so sorry for families in which that happened. Mm -hmm. You know it happened by the millions. You got an immediate family of six people. I can guarantee you one of them thought the vaccine yeah. should be taken or you should eat shit and die. Mm -hmm. And um and and so there, there there was irreparable damage done throughout society by by people who who not only signed off, but signed off with, with aggression. Right. And the anti-vaxxers, by definition, you know, of course, the, the vaxxers thought that the anti-vaxxers were risking the health of grandma. It right. was scientifically unsound. Yeah. It took just a, you know, if grandma's vaccinated, then, then supposedly, according to your model, she's fine, Right. Oh my God! What so, a propaganda! This is a total mass formation. Whatever mass psychosis. Right, Matthias. The thing, is, the thing is, I mean, are they preparing you know for another whatever disease act, whatever that is? Will, will it work? I mean, yeah, but with the WHO, with their own you know executive branch, or you know, uh, they're they're trying to overimpose you know the 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 epidemic uh, sort of execution. Uh, via, I, I don't know what's the plan, you know. I mean, well, the problem is the next one could be one where it really is life or death to get vaccinated. Sure, yeah, there, there could be one where it's Ebola, Ebola on steroids, sure. right? Yeah, and then then you face this okay, now they basically aimed a gun right at my head, now I have to make a decision, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I just I have to check something here, just a sec. Yeah. Um, I I don't know how to think about this shit. I don't know. I don't know how to think about this stuff. Yeah. I do know that a bowl that, that, that COVID opened the eyes. Yeah. This, yeah, this definitely, I mean, I see that. I mean, we see that, but unfortunately too late because we know so many people around, you know, loved ones who, who've got their, whatever. Well, it's it's, the it's the not shots. too late if there's more coming. Ooh, yeah. This is not, this is not the final chapter. Yeah. Uh, yeah.
So, so I, I would argue they overplayed. If, if the they, who's the they? Self-assembling <laughs> oligarchy, who's the they? Yeah. If they, if their goal was to break down sovereign states and things like that and get to some place that we don't understand, mm-hmm. I think they overplayed COVID. Right. They, they went for everything. They should have, you know, the decision to say natural immunity doesn't count and things like that they 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 went for they went for they they set the bar too high yeah and, Maybe. and it's scientifically unsound high. yeah yeah um dave um i want to close up or wrap up with just final question are you following in any way um Ben Davidson on Twitter or YouTube, Suspicious Observers, I think it's on YouTube, and Sun Weatherman on Twitter X. The guy is pretty what? solid. The, he's like What's solid. the name of the guy? How do ben, you spell the His sun? name is Ben Davidson, but it's on, on Twitter it's Sun Weatherman. One word. S U N weather yes. as in weather. Yeah, as Sun in... Weatherman, Ben Davidson. And his YouTube channel is Suspicious Observers. And but maybe we can we can talk about the like next time because I think it's like you know I've taken up enough time of you but you know the magnetic field of the Earth has been decreasing weakening exponentially within uh, mm-hmm. in the last hundred years and uh, you know people the thing is people do not understand they don't look at it they ignore it they, they look they, they just ignore the data that you're solid I mean <laughs> you know uh, science. Uh, and I think we are overdue. Uh, a lot of Earth disaster cycles, the phases, I think we're overdue. Even the current event, which you know happens every whatever 150, 200 years. I know. Six, seven, eight. Well, they're times. already warning us now about a about a hack job in our grid and stuff. So a friend of mine named David Tice, who used to be famous for being a bear during the dot-com bubble, is now building um Prepper communities, and he 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 did a he did a documentary, which is the producer of with uh, uh, Dennis Quaid as the voice. Wow. I haven't watched it yet. Uh-huh. Um, called Grid Down, uh-huh. and I sat with him for about oh, about three hours. We just chatted about the olden days and stuff. And he but he's really up in this. But he's got a prepper community where he's got the supplies. That's the exactly forces, what they're doing. The, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what they're doing in Colorado. And the prepper, that's right. The prepper, the prepper movement is picking up tremendous momentum. Yeah. I was talking to, I shouldn't name him, but we all know his name. Uh, one of the truly most beloved podcasters and, and money managers. Um, and he said he was sitting at a table with a bunch of hedge fund managers. And he said, to the last person at the table, they all had bug out plans. Oh, my God. And, he, and I said, and that is what, to, to be precise? And he said, um, we had dinner together in Vegas. Um, he said, um, you make a phone call, you get it, go to the airport, you get on your jet, you fly, everything gets triggered by the phone call. But where do, where do you fly to? I mean, there are just only a few spots where they, you're, they well, have islands and weird places. No, but is that really, see, well, I, I'm not sure whether they're I, I don't know. I, in their I, understanding. I, I, Having a house in Guatemala doesn't seem like that great an idea to me, and I, I I don't know, but but they have them. Okay, okay, okay. The best argument for Bitcoin, by the way, the best in my opinion, is the ability to to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and people always say, "Oh, if you have your gold offshore," and I go, "I don't want to have an ocean between me and my gold." <laughs> right? That doesn't strike me as a good move. Oh, that's and so. Uh, and so uh, I just followed uh, Sun Weatherman. Okay, um, I, I can send you like two or three short because he's done like really excellent, like summer, like super, like you know summaries, like you know fifteen minutes, twenty minutes, where he lay, lays it out like so solid science and data and facts. Okay, and just just take a look at it and uh, yeah, maybe we'll... well, there are these guys. The other guy, um, um, the other guy who gets huge respect. Is um, skeptical ethic ethical skep- skeptic? Oh, yeah, uh huh, uh huh. We're mutually connected on Twitter. I should know ethical. Uh, let me get it. I've heard of him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, ethical skeptic. Yeah, yeah. 
And I was listening to a podcast, one of my Zoom group guys who was being interviewed on CNBC or something. And he talked about ethical skeptic and he said he's really good. It's E T H I C A L S K E P T I C. The guy is beyond brilliant Great. in terms of his ability amazing. to process data. Yeah. And he focused on COVID. I mean, he really brought amazing. Okay. He good. Really brought yeah. game. There's some brilliant people on Twitter. Jesus. I mean, uh, yeah. Well, the yeah. other thing is you can, at Twitter and social media allows people who are brilliant without credentials to still mm -hmm. be brilliant. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. you are what you do on Twitter, yeah. Yeah. not who you are. Yeah. And, uh, I just want to have your take uh, because I think, uh, you know, we need to prepare and we're talking about like uh, best case scenario, 2040s, 50s, where the Micronova could occur. Seriously, it's overdue. It's overdue. Or the, uh, or the caldera in, in, in Alaska and in, um, in, in Colorado, the, uh -huh. the, the Yellowstone caldera could go. That would be, that'll be spectacular. Example. Anything, you know, tectonic plate you know, movements. I think the biggest risk is a grid yeah. problem. Yeah, uh, I think that's. I mean, we can have a nuclear war, of course, but I think that the grid going down. Yeah, and Just and absolutely. that's that's the hot war. That's not a hot war problem. Yeah, right. By any metric, that's a hot war, but it doesn't require a blue blue water navy to have it. Yeah. So there are guys out there say you could take out nine sites in the United States and bring the entire grid down. Uh -huh. Nine sites would bring down the grid. <laughs> that's incredible. Oh my God. And then the question is, are, are are guys worrying about it or are they compromised? Yeah. People are not prepared. I'm telling you. I mean, you know, I mean, we but, are. But here, here, <laughs> I have advice. It's at a much lower level. I think if you own a house, you have space. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying if you live in a 500 square foot apartment in San Francisco, this is not for you. Um You should have a stash of things. Yeah. It's not to survive the apocalypse, but you should have, for example, what's an insurance policy? Well, an insurance policy is to buy 200 pounds of rice. Yeah. Food. It costs water, what? Probably 75 yeah. bucks. Yeah. I live on a lake, so the water problem is solved. Um, and we could but, have water. Oh. Right. And, and, and to have, have some have a bunch of salt so you can put, yeah. you know, boil the rice, put in the salt and, and it, it's not nutritious. Although Asians might disagree. It it's, um, but you don't want to be three weeks into some goddamn problem. Yeah. Knowing your arm off when in fact you only got to survive another couple of weeks, but you're, you're just agonizing. So, so it is irresponsible not to have a couple of bags of rice stuff somewhere, not to have a, some some maybe maybe it's sort of a big thing of bullion cubes to throw in the rice to make yeah. it taste a little better not to have uh if you have the space not to have more toilet paper yeah not oh, to guns. have more paper towels you know so oh, i use a pantry model which is and and potentially guns but there's people who don't like guns yeah if we really go road warrior then these simple plans tend to fall apart because you're you become a victim of desperate people very yeah, quickly yeah this, that's the problem yeah that's why and and, and the guys who worry about this shit yeah they will tell you that uh, very few people are ready for that mm -hmm. and they said when you're prepping you have to ask if my neighbor comes over do i let them in if i have relatives who i told them to prepare and they didn't what do i owe them you you have to answer these questions exactly yeah. in advance yeah and um this is why guys like chris martinson lives in a community Mm -hmm. And they connect with each other. You need a corporation. Yeah, it's like it's like the movie, uh, great movie, Kevin Costner, The Postman. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. you know it's that sort of thing. I, and I don't want to have to survive an apocalypse. Oh, I man. have no interest in trying. <laughs> I do want to survive a two month problem. Mm -hmm. And and if I if, if for some reason I don't make it because I wasn't ready for two months. I really blew that. Yeah. So when, when we sheltered, when COVID showed up, the minute the discussion of lockdown started, I went straight to the stores and started banging hard mm -hmm. on everything we needed, getting yeah. protein, getting canned food, getting everything. I had prepared for this during Y2K. Now, people laugh about it. Hey, yeah, 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 that was stupid. No, it wasn't. It was an unknown risk, and I was ready for an unknown risk, mm -hmm. and it didn't cost me that much. And if it had turned into risk became reality, 
So, you know, I also have been paying for life insurance for years and I don't, I don't slap myself for that either. <laughs> so, so when, when COVID shut up, lockdown shut up, I had already done huge intellectual gymnastics mm -hmm. to understand the consequences of supply chain disruptions. Yeah. So I was straight to the store and started filling up the car with the things that I knew and that I had to have. And, and then at one point, so my son and his main squeeze show up. So we had a great time, actually. We sheltered. We really had a great experience. But at one point, I, I said, can each of you live on one roll of toilet paper a week? And they said, yeah. My wife said, well, didn't you say you were ready? I said, well, I was ready for two. Let me check our inventory. And I came back and I said, well, good news, bad news. I don't know. But at one a week per person, we will run out in two and a half years. <laughs> But here's the deal. I will use that toilet paper for the rest of my life. Right, right. Oh, my God. And I, and I have probably 400 pounds of rice in the basement. Super. Brilliant. And, Brilliant. and I, bought, I bought canned food that I would be willing to give to the dogs as dog yeah. food yeah. if for some reason I decide. Whereas when my son comes from Boston, I say, I'll hit the fridge and take some of the frozen, frozen meat, you know, uh -huh. with you. And he's a violinist, so he's not rich. And I'll replace the shit at some point. Mm -hmm. But I, and Jim Rickards, who I've known for many years too, um, he said that people are worried about what to do with their investments and shit. He said, I'm worried about how many freezers I should own. Mm -hmm. And Jim's not an irrational guy. I mean, he's, he just, he's, he's looked at too many war games and stuff, too many, too many gaming scenarios and so so I really think it's irresponsible to not ask the question, would I be okay? And if you look in your cupboard and say, Oh, I've got lots of food, you are dead wrong on that. Right, right. You'll go through that in a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the you know, and then the spot, the the place, the location where you you know this well, is I live in Ithaca. Depending, you know, what what's gonna happen, is it gonna be a solar nova, whatever, a micronova or a geomagnetic excursion, you know, whatever you want to call it, but 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 uh, there are just a few places, you know, when it's really like the worst of the worst coming. Like in, in a so if I thought the United States was going to go through a, a dark period that was protracted. Mm -hmm. As in, uh, not so much like no food, but rather politically dangerous. Mm -hmm. I, I would consider moving out into some place that's sparsely populated. And my nearest neighbor, who's quite a ways away, voted for Trump. <laughs> <laughs> there, you know, I'd go to Montana or something. You know, there, there are places to go, and uh, I wouldn't want to leave the country. Uh, that doesn't strike me as the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, at one point, I said, um, "I said, I, I said that," and some some guy said, "Well, I live in one of those places, and you might not be welcome." And I'm thinking about, it, I'm going, you know, there is that right, that famous country. You know, that Western phrase that they said, you're not from these parts, are you? You know, I, you know, you become an, when in the old days, some stranger came into town, all eyes were on that guy because he was not one of us. Right. So um, I have a friend who has a big house. He's a very wealthy guy in Idaho, where it's an 18 mile boat ride to get to his house. Wow. Uh huh. And he also because of fire issues, mm -hmm. set up a fire suppression system that would drop 400 gallons a minute over his house. And he showed me a map one day where there were fires. He says, here's my house. Here's the fires. Incredible. Oh, and, and, I, and, and so he went out there. Uh -huh. And I said, make sure you have the keys to your boat. And he says, oh, you don't just have the keys to your boat. You put the keys in the ignition of your boat. Uh-huh. So that there's no way you can not get to that boat and get out of there. <laughs> and um, and I said, yeah, you've been thinking about this, haven't you? <laughs> what a genius! What a genius! Totally prepped and prepared. And there, you know, think of the think of the the German Jew in 1936 yeah. sitting around the dining room table and going, you know, one guy saying we got to get out of here, and the next one saying, no, this will blow over. Mm -hmm. Now some couldn't get out, and I don't know the distribution. I. I, I would love someone who, who actually knows what percentage of the Jews in theory could have left. Yeah. 
if they had spotted the problem. It's possible it just wasn't doable. I know that immigrate, emigrating from, from Germany as a Jew to the United States was not easy, for example. Yeah, there was, there was a builder plan with Israel, but but I don't know. It's just, I don't know. It's just very muddy waters, uh, but I don't want to. It's yeah. very muddy, but but the fa the point is people sit you around the dining room table and some said yes and some said no. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And there are times where, it's like in markets, there's times where the risks turn into an unbelievable reality. Mm -hmm. And and the fact that something there's a famous quote from S Silas Marner that basically says something like you know it's often cited as evidence as something that has not happened in a long time is evidence it won't happen when it's actually evidence that it's imminent. You know, no earthquakes in California. You know, no crash in the markets. You know that it's been over, but just on the market, there's a great thing. People don't understand risk. The markets haven't seriously corrected for 40 years. The markets did not get deeply below fair value in 2008 and 2009. Mm -hmm. They were about a little below fair value for about a month. I, I predict we could have 40 years of just pain, knee cake quality pain. <laughs> um, no one's ready for that. What I, what I know to be true is as I look at analysis by the pros, Almost none of them talk about valuations on an absolute scale. Mm -hmm. Almost none of them say, look, if we correct back to 1980 levels, not price, but in terms of valuation. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go there because you got to get off too, but we had so many tailwinds from 81 to the present, 40 years, that the market valuations, which should not change, they should flutter around because as you move randomly, but there's no upward trend or downward trend. They just go back and forth, overvalued, undervalued, overvalued, undervalued. Mm -hmm. The market valuations, price divided by GDP or sales or revenue or earnings or whatever, over the 40 years, compounded at 3% a year. What happens if over the next... 40 years, they compound at negative 3% a year. Oh, my. Those are, and, and people say, don't be silly. That would never happen. I go, of course it's going to happen. Are you telling me never in the future are we going to get undervalued? Never in the history of markets have overvalued markets stayed overvalued. Mm -hmm. Never. There's not a single moment. Because but, they always that, but, but how many people do you understand what you understand? I mean, this well, many... it might be might be you and me. <laughs> no, man. I mean, how many no, people, there's people who do? People in... I can tell you people who I sense really understand it. Um, a lot of people I talk to, I get to understand it, but they also have trader thinking, so mm -hmm. so so that they don't express it. I think Jesse Felder understands it. Mm -hmm. He's on Twitter. I think uh, Stephanie Pomboy understands it. I think Grant Williams understands it. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's probably Sam Druckenmiller probably understands it. Uh -huh. um, I think uh, I'm not a big fan of of um, of um, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Uh, um, Bridgewater guy, come on, give me his name. Head of Bridgewater. I think it's such fun in the world. Yeah, I'm not good at names. Oh, no, 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 no. Bridgewater. How can I not remember his name? Oh, come on. He wrote a book, for Christ's sake. Um, Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio. Yeah, Ray really? Dalio. Okay. Uh -huh. Ray Dalio has written a book. I'm not a Dalio fan. I talked to one of his... Yeah, me neither. He, one of his peers who thought he was a complete fraud. I think he's he, a he fiat said, subsidized. He be, he is, he's because he's so, you know, success, he's a fiat subsidized... Uh, this, this guy said to me with a totally straight face, I now believe that he does have a hedge fund. Uh-huh, yeah. That's how crazy he, his view of Dalio was. Um, but Dalio wrote a book that was kind of like a a new angle on the fourth turning. And and he had six phases, not four. He had a hundred year cycle, not an 80 year cycle. He didn't have all the mumbo jumbo social shit in it. 
But he talked about cycles that basically start and do various things and end up in the war cycle, which is the fourth turning for, for Strauss and Howe. And he says we're right on the, the cusp of level six. We're, we're, we're about to enter the war cycle. And that it will be decades mm-hmm. of just really destructive behavior. You would have a terrible time arguing that's not true. Or at least not probable. Mm-hmm. Everything we do seems to be aimed at that now. And so I don't I, I don't think you can hedge against the bad stuff. Right? If we have an EMP and it takes out the grid, right. Right. I think we're just gonna die. I've got enough Valium to do the job painlessly. Right. Um do you know Martin Armstrong? Uh the Yeah. Uh, what do you think about this guy? I, I have a mixed emotion about him. In the sense that a lot of things he said make sense, but he's got this sort of model that he's really confident yeah. in. That I, I go, yeah. Addis, I don't trust that model at his level. I had communications with him when he was in prison. Interesting. Uh huh. It turns out documentary- when I said something to him, it went through his daughter. Uh huh. Prison. He used to write blogs from prison, handwritten. Oh my God. Yeah. Incredible. And, and I don't know if he deserved to be a president. I don't know anything about that. But um, I think he's thoughtful. I, you listen to Stram Druckenmiller, who is more successful than Buffett. Uh-huh. He, he compounded something like 34% a year for 30 years. Wow. Mm-hmm. Stan is terrified. Stan's, Stan's interviews yeah. are apocalyptic. Yeah. Um, guys like Howard Marks is more soft-spoken. Um. I think guys like Einhorn know big trouble's coming, but he's got a little bit, he's developed more of a trader mentality of late. I think he's, I think he was more sort of long term. He, he's, he's changed his thinking about what value means. I just listened to an interview of his the other day and it made sense. He, he said, if you buy a value stock that never goes up, you're not going to get paid. He said, therefore, you have to buy. Investments that pay you to own the investment. I see. Mm-hmm. Which is exactly right. So you want to buy a company. Like I have a bunch of Rio Tinto. They got a dividend of probably five or six percent. Mm-hmm. Priced well. Their mines are all over the world. They can't be taken out by one event. It would have to be something truly colossal. And so mm-hmm. um, so I like that. Um, and so low PE, high cash flow, pay you to own the company. Treat it as a royalty trust, if you wish. Um, and he says he's got stuff with PEs of five, four, five. And one time I asked him, you know, give me an example. I'm going to tell you. I said, give me something that's cheap. This is a breakfast. And he says, uh, he says, now he also says, you know, some of my shit turns into dogs. <laughs> and he says, Bright House Financial. They're a mess right now. It'll take them a couple of years to sort of burn through the problems, but I think it's a good investment. Um, That had to have been, I don't know, eight years ago now. And it's gone nowhere. And right now it has no dividend. But so the best investment money can buy, the best, the best brain money can buy. And that one didn't work. I don't blame him. Mm -hmm. He says 30% of his investments don't work. Great, great support for a thing called Jaguar Mining, which had low PE, dividends, good balance sheet. One problem is it mines gold. (laughs) That never works. And and I've been slaughtered by it. I think you just got to accept that, right? A certain percentage. Right, Right. but that's why I'm not a stock picker, actually, because I I don't know how to do it. So I I try to figure out trends. I go, okay, the trend going forward for the next 20 years is going to be this. How do I invest in it? He Uh says, I heard says something very astute, by the way, which I want to follow up on with him. Um, He said, try to invest as directly as you can in it. So if you think the price of oil is going to go up, you can invest in this oil company, this oil company, this oil company, but, you know, they can have well problems. There's also, he said, buy oil. Mm-hmm. So he says, so he basically right. says, minimize the number of moving parts between you and that target. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Right? And so uh, so if you think platinum's going to soar, you could buy the platinum miners, which look dirt cheap. 
but they also have the complexity of South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I happen to own them and they haven't been great investments. Or I could just buy platinum. Now, it has gone nowhere also. But if the bet is platinum's going to go up, it doesn't matter what South Africa does. Yeah. So in that sense, you're investing past the risk of the South African connection. Now, I happen to sit down. This is I, I try to network. I happen to sit down for a couple of hours this summer with the largest holder of Sabanye, mm -hmm. which is one of the big three miners. And we chatted about platinum and why the platinum miners, the pros and cons and investing in general. So I have a very interesting conversation. He happens to own a house about eight miles from my cabin in the Adirondacks. We just kind of discovered that overlap. And um, so that was a night. He, he, write, he emails me and says, you know, I'm a largest holder of Sabanye. I'd like to have a chat. I go, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd love to have that chat. Fantastic. And, uh, so and, what, um, have you changed your position on, on, on Bitcoin yet, or is that the same? I, I'm waiting for something to tell me. So the two Even risks the spot of ETFs that haven't like given you well, some the two signal. the two risks of Bitcoin are um first of all the story has changed. For example, the guys who said you should own Bitcoin to buy stuff, that's not gonna work now. Okay. Right? Bitcoin is an investment. I don't buy treasuries to buy groceries either, so I don't care. Right? But but um I think there are two risks is that the government turns against them hard. They will eventually It will eventually. Well, I mean, but the matter. problem then becomes is if the government says, look, it's illegal to do anything in Bitcoin, how many people are going to use it? Yeah, but I think that was the first intention. Anyway, whether it be Satoshi Nakamoto or, you know, uh, it's, well, it's black market money. I mean, <laughs> that was... You know, right, but that's that's a little too fringy for my taste. Okay. Now, here's the other interesting thing. Satoshi gets a lot of press. Supposedly the worst, the first paper ever written on cryptocurrency with the word coin in it with the word currency in it with the word was a three author paper from the nsa uh -huh. yeah it might have been i mean you know well, well but, but but when the nsa is the seminal moment of bitcoin uh -huh. Uh -huh. one should say do i fully understand why bitcoin was brought into existence well What if, what if, yeah, initially there would have been one or many people, uh, maybe it came originally from, you know, whatever, maybe they were, you know, working with, but then they, they you know, they isolated themselves and say, you know what, well, we can but, do the, a super well, decentralized, me, absolute scarcity but, money. But what if they said, look, let's, let's get to central bank digital currencies. Let's, let's start with a crypto and, and crowdsource the bugs mm -hmm. acclimate the world to digital currency but it's a difference i mean you know there's just two worlds oh it's there's a oh no no it's a fundamental difference but w what if then the idea is okay now we squash bitcoin we bring in central bank digital currency we've achieved our goal i'm not sure Maybe it's the best advertising for, for Bitcoin then, because people will May and know what pain is, you know, like being controlled. Well, but you know, when the Soviet Union formed. Oh, yeah, Jesus. Well, then. Okay. I, I, I'm back to the, it was in plain sight. It didn't stop it from going bad. I know. But then we lost. I mean. So then the second, right. Then right. the second risk to me is, is for the system to normalize Bitcoin to the point where it loses its special mm -hmm. component. So if Bitcoin becomes hyper-regulated, becomes, you know, mm -hmm. GLD did not help gold. Yeah. GLD, I think, was put into place to absorb demand for gold. Okay. So the ETF could be a way to absorb demand for Bitcoin without pushing the price of Bitcoin up. Okay, yeah. But you're talking about like custodial, centralized, you know, on-ramp, off-ramp. But I'm talking like about like self-custodial you know open source self i'm talking about the i'm talking about the tea party yeah. that became the tea party wing of the republican party uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right you try to break away they just reabsorb you so I, I, i it's just it's just not obvious to me that that the hodlers say you know they can't touch us i go have you ever seen an authoritarian state mm -hmm. in operation 
What does Mark Ben say to you? I mean, when you talk about about Bitcoin, we I'm, we tend not to talk about it too much. He he I, he knows know, my Bitcoin know. stances so well that that there's no way. You know, he makes jokes. He says, "I'll help you." You know, and I go, you know, and he knows I'm sympathetic. I'm not hammering Bitcoin. I'm right. waiting for the moment where. So, so I've actually ordered the Bitcoin standard. Yeah, great. I have I have not done my homework. Yeah, is orange pill me? To be honest with you, I mean, because I'm, the, I'm going to read Lynn Alden's book. Who, if anyone can convince me, Lynn great book. can. Great book. And and both of them are in the queue. Mm -hmm. And. And it'll either become clear to me that I've been just out of the loop, mm. or it'll give me a better view of what I'm really watching for. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for some for some moment where the bulb goes off, where the light mm -hmm. switch goes. And to me, to me, Bitcoin versus the state capital S is the big yeah. issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I talk to a lot of hodlers who say, "No, you're right. That day will come, and we're going to have to win it." And you know, and yeah. It, it's one of those things, do I want to play that sort of risky game? This is someone like saying, why don't you play rugby? I go, well, I see, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't need to get banged up. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, I'm not skateboarding down railings. Yeah. You know, there's just, I, 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 I'm also revolutions are manned by young. Mm -hmm. So Bitcoin's got older followers, but it's really a youthful revolution. It is, yeah. It's also the greenest investment class ever. It is, yeah. The only thing so, so you, it, it's, a par it's a paradox. It's yeah. a paradox. Yeah. It's so what green what says don't touch it. Yeah. And youthful revolution says that's what revolutions look like. Exactly. It's not like the computers were brought in by old guys. Yeah. So it's so really I, yeah. it's really I, I I watch with interest. I yeah. turned I said no to it at ten bucks. Yeah. <laughs> it but, does, you know, I don't lose. I don't lose talk, sleep. You know, remember we talked about the the grid, the micronova. I think that's the only thing. You know, because then everything is gone. The satellites, the grid, everything. You know, you have nothing then, and then you can. You know, but, but I don't even. You know, keeping your own codes and stuff. I get pissed off at double logins to my to websites and shit. <laughs> so 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 I've got the boomer sort of view. And, and I say it's a digital currency. The Bitcoin go, no, it's not a digital currency. Well, it's a fucking digit. It's, it's not digital. a hard coin. You know, it is digital. And, and there's something that so annoys me about the yeah. digital world and Bitcoin's in that world. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't want to sit there and go, I don't, I got to get to the Bitcoin. I, I, it's, it's one of these, yeah. I don't need more to worry about. Yeah. But it's getting easier, much, much, by orders of magnitude. I mean, if, you know, comparing to last, you know, years or last 15 years, it's gotten extremely easy. I mean, we, just with a mobile and wallet. If, or, and if, if I decide to, but I don't even keep my phone on me at all times. Yeah, it's true. No, you need a hard you know, that, you need So a hard I'm a, no, 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 but it makes me a Luddite. It shows, it shows you that I'm not, yeah. I've downloaded five apps probably from the internet. You know, if I look at the apps I downloaded, they are a grammar program. <laughs> I'm annoyed by the fact it keeps prompting me to do something that I don't want to do. It just keeps happening over and over. I downloaded my hearing aids, um, uh, Twitter, Telegram, Cam Scanner, Audible. I think a Hotel 19, which oh, is a GPS. <laughs> and that's it. Oh, Zoom and Zoom. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, those are the apps that are on my phone that didn't start out on my phone. Right. This is a luddite, right? This is a guy who's, this is a guy who's going to be old and incapable of comprehending the modern world. No, but I understand you. I mean, I'm not all, um, I'm not the youngest anyway, but you know, I I, I do understand it because it's got to, you know, it's just got to be much more user friendly, easier, and just no, know. no, it's not. But it's not just that. I I really don't. First of all, Bitcoin has been an in inflation. People and and the Bitcoiners are happy to be play that role, but they don't realize that when you create when you create cryptocurrencies and you generate two trillion dollars worth of wealth from nothing. That's inflation. Mm, yeah, but it's not pre-mined. You know, it's like, you know. No, no, no. I'm just saying it's inflation. That money came from scratch. What it means is there's two, tr two, two trillion dollars worth of 
wealth that people perceive, are acting upon, are shaping their lives by, in the consumer's pocket, that's wealth. And so so I, I find it curious that, that no one talks about that aspect. Mm -hmm. That's QE. Yeah, but but they had to put energy into it. You know what I'm saying? I, mean, I know, I know. There there was a cost. I remember when people were mining Bitcoin on their phones, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. That that was that was quaint. Yeah. Some grad student wanted to buy it at sixty, and I said, "Be careful, right?" He probably mm -hmm. still wants to kill me. If I had bought it at ten, like I said, I was wow. on Lauren Lister's show, and she asked me about Bitcoin back in I don't know two thousand nine or something, twelve maybe. Um, what would have happened is I would have bought it at 10. I wouldn't have bought much and I would have sold it at 50. Yeah, probably. I, a lot of OGs would, did that, by the way, you know, a lot of OG, you know, like people who are really from beginning, not everybody like, you know, like Max Kais. I think he understood it from the beginning. Like Max, Kais, like people at Max Kais, Stacey Herbert, you know, like. Either under, yeah, I, I, I've done several podcasts with him. Max also has a wildly rogue streak in him. Yeah, yeah. There was some so, so he got he's it. got he's got the piss and vinegar to just go head first into something. Yeah, you know, Leroy Jenkins. Yeah, and I know Max is worth a fortune now yeah, he because is. he got it because at one point he had like ten thousand Bitcoin. Yeah, and he gave and it. Away. I don't know. He gave it away. I think to Alex Jones, Russell, but but they all lost them. They all lost the keys. These idiots. But <laughs> well, that's. That's like ten thousand or one thousand. I don't know. Something I like know. 10, I know. I know. Someone, you know, some guy bought a pizza for some like twenty thousand Bitcoin. Yeah. Early okay. On, I mean, they, at least they got the economy going. You know, I'm saying. You know, it. It's, well, I don't think that. I don't think that gets the economy going. But, but, but that's not the whole issue. That, 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 that's not the issue. The issue is, um, I don't need something else to worry about. Mm -hmm. It's, and I have to worry about. You know, when I buy a Fidelity fund. But it goes up or down. But it's it's something I know. It's mm -hmm. like being married to some woman for thirty years. You you get to the point where you know you can predict what what she's going to do when you get home. You know that sort of thing. And and I don't know about you, but I think about if my wife ever died, the idea of dating is like I I can't fathom it. I do not need to have to break in a new wife, right? I this and that's kind of Bitcoin. Yeah, I see. No, I get you. Uh, I kind of don't need it. I don't know where, back to the dating thing, I don't know why guys don't just, when they get a divorce, don't just buy a four-bedroom house, start a fraternity, watch football Sundays and drink beer and, you know, just watch TV together. And Why get married again? I don't understand it. But there's obviously a biological imperative that says do it, do it, because everyone seems to go back to that trough. Yeah. No. Even though we all think we'd rather hang out with our buddies yeah we don't do that yeah exactly and it needs some maturity i think you know it was um, with the maturity but you know well men fix cars women fix men yeah <laughs> that's true <laughs> oh man oh, the other the other one is um men marry women hoping they'll never change and women marry men hoping they will <laughs> yeah god so much wisdom in it i i say to my class which is 75 percent women i say I said, I have no idea why you guys marry us. <laughs> to me, we're really marginally civilized, right? I don't, I don't know why you do it. That's that's a, a typical joke in class, right? I, yeah, but once you have children and you're really, you know, you have. Oh, I get that part. I get that part. Yeah, it's it's totally everything is just changes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know people say, I don't want to have kids. You know, I, I don't think I'd be a good mom. I go. You have no idea no what idea. happens. No. You have no idea what happens to you when that kid arrives. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a staggering transformation. But it's a beautiful. Yeah, it's 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 yeah, it's 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 so unique, very unique, very unique. Yeah, you will never be the same, and you never. will never you will never look back, exactly. unless of course your kid's a total loser. Then you might regret it. But. <laughs> Anyway, Dave, thank you so much. I always, you know, I'm so happy and appreciate, you know, your time and everything. Well, we went into some dark alleys. Very dark alleys. Any and final like to, thoughts you want I'd to say? I'd like to thank the two the two listeners who are still with us. Um, <laughs> no final thoughts. We talked about it. I, I, what final thought? Um, uh, be careful of the markets, of course. I think they're treacherously, I think they're horrifically dangerous now. And 
geopolitics is worse. Mm -hmm. um, try to enjoy yourself. Uh, to young people, I'm young. Don't go down the rabbit holes we talked about. Rabbit hole, leave the rabbit holes to the old guys. You, you got to build robots. You got to get a job. Yeah. You got to raise a family. Do, but once you get on those rabbit holes, you'll yeah. never be the same. And yeah. I don't it wish that upon so you. So much energy and power. Oh my God. Yeah. 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 So, so I get people coming to see me because they've gone down a rabbit hole. I go, leave, go back out, <laughs> read about chemistry, read about, read about sports, <sighs> bet, on, bet on the Super Bowl, yeah. whatever. That's a wise advice, yeah. Anyway, Dave, thank you so much, and I hope we can do this again sometime soon. We certainly will, unless one of us goes to the light. Okay, Dave. Adios. Adios.